Oh god, all this stuff is still here. <laughs> Hold on. Okay. Hello. Let me double check. My audio is on. Okay, good. <laughs> Hello. It feels like it's been a long time, even though it hasn't been, but I've been taking some time off <laughs> because it's so hot. Um, let me actually check to see what the exact temperature is right now. Uh, it's only a hundred today. Big, big quotes on only. <laughs> Uh, earlier this week, it was like 104 to 106, so I couldn't stream at that time. But now, hopefully, we can actually finally get back to, um, to Peace Walker. We got to the... I think, the last boss, and didn't have enough ammo to defeat it. So, I did some more grinding off, off screen, got a couple new guns that hopefully will help. But we also have some side stuff to do as well. Let's see if I can actually get my controller to work. We're probably going to start off... Mm. Yeah, let's start off with the... The tapes, I think. Because we haven't listened to, like, any of those, and I want to actually want to. And I think some side stuff only opens if you listen to the, um... The tapes. So, you can see that Metal Base has gotten a decent amount, <laughs> decent amount larger. Um, still building stuff. My my actual staff still isn't the best. Like this is still mostly C's, mostly C's. Audio. There we go. For some reason, it was really loud in my head. <laughs> um, I believe I got... a new rocket launcher, which should help. with the boss fight. Also got the goose off. I don't remember if I had that last time. Um... Oh, also... We have legs now. <laughs> I just got to legs and thought... I was really afraid that if I continued to build Zeke, that a cutscene would play. <laughs> So I decided to save some of that. 
worst case scenario, we can we can do some grinding on stream. Don't take that out of context. Uh, also. Also done a ton of outer ops. Legs? I wish I had legs like that, honestly. Also, hello, Melody. We got up to S rank with these, and then I was like, eh. <laughs> I wasn't really getting anything out of these. Oh, I also did, like, almost all of the extra ops. <laughs> There's only one I haven't done that I have unlocked. Hopefully, more of these will unlock once I actually beat the boss. Because apparently the only way to get, like, S-rank soldiers is either with the Wi-Fi stuff that doesn't exist anymore or grinding, like, certain missions that I don't have unlocked. So that's probably not going to happen. But before we actually get into the game, I want to listen to the file library. Whoa, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> What kind of shape is that plant the professor gave us in? First time I laid eyes on it, I thought it was some kind of joke. It was a giant birdhouse. Seagulls everywhere. We eventually scraped off most of the rust and bird crap. The underlying structure's intact. Little elbow grease, and we should be in business. At this point, we've like replaced everything. What's in now? Somebody sank some serious money into building it. From what I can tell, an American university built it as a research platform for ocean thermal energy conversion. The name's still on some of the rusty old power turbines. I'm guessing they must have had government and corporate assistance to build it, too. But they couldn't solve the thermal efficiency problem, and the project was canceled. Then after the university abandoned it, a KGB front company scooped it up for next to nothing. At least that's my theory. How'd the KGB manage to buy a plant built with American capital, front company or not? Yeah, that professor is quite the operator. One other thing. The plant's set up so that it can join up with other plants of the same standard. So, they were originally planning on expanding the place, huh? Hey, let's give it a shot. We can get some more people together and build this place up into a proper home for MSF. You're with me on this, right, boss? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Let me know if the audio and everything is okay, by the way. I have technically two fans on, but hopefully those shouldn't pick up. The new plant is a hex type. That gives it more surface area than previous types, and also makes it easier to plan expansions. We're gonna make this place huge. Hex, huh? Like a beehive. Nothing wrong with that. They say the honeycomb design is one of the strongest. I hear they're even thinking of using it in tank armor. Good enough for me. I'll see about finding us some worker bees. Appreciate it, boss. Snake. A lot of this stuff is probably going to be, like, technically tutorial stuff. Unconscious mercenaries you encounter back to Mother Base. I know you've used the Fulton before, but just to make sure I'm not missing anything, let's review the steps. Okay. First, attach a balloon to the unconscious enemy or captured prisoner. Right. I hook a wire to the waist, and on the other end of the wire, there's a... But I'm kind of afraid to skip those, because sometimes they sprinkle other stuff into the tutorial, the tutorial dialogue. Into its cargo hold. And that's it. And that's it. We finished installing the recovery hook on the Huey. Wait, guys. Something you tested that on Huey? Process. I thought we just met him. Well, normally, Fulton recovery is for when you're using fixed-wing aircraft. With a helicopter... Isn't it simpler to land and pick up directly? Listen, Snake. You're going to be calling for recoveries repeatedly throughout your mission. We want to keep the risk of taking enemy fire to a minimum. The best way to get that done is to do the recovery in a high-speed flyby. That's what the Fulton surface-to-air recovery system is for. Uh-huh. 
What's the real reason? Helicopters are cheaper, and the repair <laughs> bills will start adding up once the bullets start flying. Uh, I <laughs> thought so. Cause I know we need to keep costs down, but... Boss, you really need to get rid of this whole army mentality. We're not the Pentagon. We don't have billions of taxpayer dollars to play with. And besides... Fine. I mean, I have quite a bit of GDP at this point. Helicopters have quicker response time. Sounds strange, yeah, but it works great. I promise. You'll get used to it before long. Remember why we created MSF Snake. To provide military force to whoever needs it, wherever they are, regardless of nation or ideology. Our beliefs aren't all that lofty. We just won't be the tools of any one country. Exactly. We know only how to fight. But we refuse to live our lives at the whim of the state. The MSF seal is patterned after Pangaea, the supercontinent from 250 million years ago. It looks like a skull to me. The world was one landmass. One world. No gaps, no rifts. Our strength will take us back there. Am I the only person who thinks, like, Pangea doesn't make sense? Like, technically, wouldn't there still be other islands? Just by virtue of being, you know, a planet? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Kaz? Any interest in expanding MSF? You'd better believe it. I want to make us into an organization that doesn't take orders from any country. Just like you were saying, we have to be strong. Strong enough to defend ourselves. We need money, too. Money to train soldiers to fight. The way I see it, we make MSF into something along the lines of a new kind of business. A contractor providing the full range of military services. Not just combat, but logistics, training, weapons, outfitting, and R&D. Combining the small footprint and exceptional performance of special forces with the raw military might of a full regular army. Only with that kind of power can we break free of nation states. What I need from you, boss, is to go out and find guys we can bring back here using Fulton Recovery. I still don't what get... Use them for. I'll take care of the How they think they're anything other than just a mercenary band. Your old mentor, the boss. She was known in the West as the mother of special forces, right? <laughs> Nothing but propaganda. Actually, it's not all that far from the truth. I heard the KGB just set up a counter-sabotage cell. Alpha Group, I think they call it. There's even a rumor that West Germany created a counter-terrorist unit within its border police after the debacle at the Munich Olympics. Back home in the States, they've got the illustrious Green Berets, the Seals, and your personal creation, Foxhound. The seeds sown by the boss are beginning to sprout. You Safe. don't need that many, I don't think. <laughs> carrying on the will of the boss. Yeah. She taught me how to fight the hard way. She beat it into me. And now, thanks to her, we can take on missions other than just conventional combat. After all, we've got the same mother as the Army's special forces. Still can't believe Professor Galvez was KGB. Well, like the professor said, Moscow's hell-bent on communizing Latin America. Yeah, the Cuban intel services are all in the KGB's pocket. You don't think he's got some kind of ulterior motive? Mm -hmm. If the CIA is up to something, it's only natural that the KGB wants to know about it. But I doubt they're showing us their full hand. We'd better watch our backs. What do you think, Kaz? Why did Paz come all the way to Columbia herself? It's a long trip to make just to be Exhibit A in Galvez's sales pitch. She's only 16. Still a kid. Maybe we should take her wish for peace at face value. That seems naive. I had just the label. What's the worst that could happen? Costa Rica is no All of A teenager would never lie about anything. The whole ideological In the end, it's just a greedy scramble for wealth by the ruling classes. The 
Western bourgeois stand to lose everything if their country still comes. After all, the communists want to abolish private property altogether. Based? So the capitalist rulers desperately tried to halt the global spread of communism, hence the phenomenon of red baiting. And the communists, for their part, didn't exactly stay true to their principles. They tried to escape class-based society. But between Stalin's autocracy and the rise of the nomenclatura, they ended up creating one anyway. Once people have power, they stop caring about equality. That's where communism, where society in general, reaches its limits. The rulers only care about their own gain. The opposing side becomes a risk factor that threatens the profit. And thus, the ongoing struggle between capitalism and communism was born. And now, nuclear deterrence is part of the picture. Exactly. I'm sure that'll be over with the Cold War. That will never continue to the fucking far future. <laughs> they say nuclear weapons are the reason we haven't seen conflict on a global scale since World War II. The thought that your opponent might launch nukes against you sort of makes it tough to start an armed conflict. Especially now that they've got intercontinental ballistic missiles. Nowhere is safe. Of course, all that has caused military expenditures to skyrocket. Well, the only way to ward off a preemptive strike is to flaunt your own nuclear stockpile. And that's caused their numbers to increase exponentially, not just with regards to destructive power, but in terms of targeting technology, too. Now they can hit a target halfway across the world with pinpoint accuracy. In a way, the space race was a demonstration of that technological progress. And as a result of all that, we now have mutually assured destruction. It's the ultimate form of deterrence. No one's going to launch their nukes knowing they'll be obliterated in return. I don't know. The chance of somebody hitting the button by mistake is never zero. Oops. You're right. Even with peace guaranteed by MAD, there's always the risk of an accident. Nobody wants the world to end on account of some machines malfunctioning. On the other hand, thanks to deterrence, we haven't had a world war since 1945. You gotta admit, it has been pretty peaceful. <laughs> Not that it matters to us. People point at the nuclear arms and space races and call it a cold war. I say if they're not shooting at each other, why not call it world peace? Doesn't mean war is gone. Um... Look at Korea. Look at Vietnam. Well, yeah, but I'm talking in relative terms here. <laughs> if war died out completely, we'd be SOL. We are not warmongers. And yet, we can't survive in a world that's at peace. Hmm. You got a point. Kaz just casually ignoring almost all world conflict. been more than 10 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis, huh? I don't think we'll ever forget it. <laughs> no kidding. Those 13 days starting October 15th, 1962, were probably the closest we ever came to all-out nuclear war. The Russians deployed nuclear missiles to Cuba. America responded with a naval blockade. Then Russia shot down an American spy plane. I was still a teenager back then, but I remember what it felt like to be one step away from nuclear war. The adults were freaking out. If it wasn't for the Cuban Missile Crisis, there might never have been an Operation Snake Eater. And... What's the matter, Snake? It's not like you to get all hypothetical. Uh, I guess not. It was the reassessment after the Missile Crisis that paved the way for the hotline between Moscow and Washington, and also for detente. That's irony for you. I keep hitting sort of as if this is an older Metal Gear game. The Treaty of Platel Lolco was enacted to make Latin America into a nuclear-free zone. It bans the testing, use, manufacture, production, acquisition, storage, and deployment of nuclear weapons. The impetus was pretty obvious. The series of crises triggered by the deployment of nukes in Cuba. Not hard to imagine. Those 13 days had the whole world frozen in fear. Of course, the country that started it all, Cuba, hasn't actually ratified it yet. Still, 
The treaty's backed by over 20 countries. Anyone flouting at risk becoming an international pariah. True. Open all would investigate, no doubt. I heard they used Japan's three non-nuclear principles as their model when they drew up the treaty. I think the Treaty of Tlatel Lolko might have been their way of asking nuclear powers not to use nukes against them. That's the biggest difference between the treaty and the three principles. I guess you could call it a fourth principle. I guess that makes it make sense as to why Metal Gear Solid 1 takes place like actually within America, now that I think about it. Better than being just outside of America, just be in the actual states. So Costa Rica abolished its army back in, what, 1949? Pretty gutsy move for a Central American nation at the time. Yeah, well, they'd just come out of a civil war. I'm sure they were driven by a desire to avoid another tragedy like Pasek. But I think they had a more compelling reason. Army coup d'etat are a way of life in so many Latin American countries. Imagine seeing that up close. No army, no coup. Makes sense. Plus, their economy was in ruins, so they honestly didn't have any money to spend on an army anyway. Yeah, but weren't they on less than friendly terms with Nicaragua? Yeah, and in fact, Nicaragua did end up invading. But the Civil Guard fought back, and the OAS brokered a ceasefire. The U.S. and the rest of the OAS had their back, and they used it to full advantage. For a quarter century, they survived in the powder keg of Central America. That must have taken some serious diplomacy, even if the Civil Guard is pretty decked out for a police force. Hmm. Must be tough to be a country without an army. Didn't I hear that... Like, just a few days ago, Japan was moving forward with, like... Doing away with its like pacifist treaty so that it can have like an actual standing army. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure I'm sure nothing bad will happen. Hey Snake, mind if I ask you something? Hmm. Since when did you start asking permission? <laughs> so, uh, you used to be part of a CIA paramilitary unit, right? That's right. Ever do any ops in Central America? No, not personally. But there were other units who did all kinds of stuff. I remember the Bay of Pigs invasion back in 61. The papers had a field day with it. Operation Zapata. That was the CIA code name. The whole thing went south. Then there was Che Guevara being hunted down in Bolivia. I heard the CIA had a hand in that, too. There were several units similar to mine. MSP, SOG. They'd recruit former special forces, train them as intelligence agents, and send them on deniable covert paramilitary operations. One of those units trained the Bolivian army in counter-guerrilla tactics. And then had them shoot El Che. So the story goes. Hold on, do I have, do I have the gif? Put that down in the corner while we listen to these. <laughs> Around here, they say La CIA instead of CIA, huh? Um, nothing strange about it. That's how it's pronounced when you read it in Spanish. It has the feminine noun ending a, ah, so they use the article la. Apparently, some people have taken to using the term UCLA. That's a new one to me. What's it mean? It stands for Unilaterally Controlled Latino Assets. Meaning they're local agents? Yeah, that's the idea. Washington uses them like pawns. Nobody knows who they really are or what they're doing. I see. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the sub. Not underscore mafia underscore subscribed. Hello, welcome. We're listening to political tapes <laughs> before we get to the actual, the actual gameplay.
How are you doing? Oh wow, people are still getting getting found a The bots had the handle skulls. I wasn't sure if I still had any found a badges left. So I hear Amanda mistook you for Che Guevara Snake. That's not too bad, huh? Yeah, right. I'm not even worthy of polishing his boots. Don't be so modest. From where I'm standing, your men see you as a great man. <laughs> as great as the century's most complete human being. That's Sartre, right? Well, there's hardly been a more... Technically, we've listened to these before, but we lost it in, like, a crash, I think. That. He was a true revolutionary and a great warrior. I'm with you there. Can you believe that when he first went to Cuba with the gun, they had only 12 guys with them? But they Thought I would drop in while waiting for Tenebi and come back after? No problem. The support of the peasants expanded their organization. And in the end, they overthrew the Batista regime. People flocked to them because they were honest. They won because they were strong. Those are the qualities that make men great. You know, we're kind of in the same boat they were back then. Here we are, a handful of mercenaries taking on an army backed by the United States. Yeah, we've got a long way to go. <laughs> but we've got to keep on going. It's not just about winning in battle. You need to think about recruiting people and growing this operation. Got it. Boss, did you ever read Che Guevara's book, Guerrilla Warfare? I can't remember if I got to that one or not. You should have. That's why I lent it to you. A lot of the guerrilla tactics it covers apply to sneaking missions, too. Che was one of the first people to articulate the theory of guerrilla warfare. T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, was another one. And Mao Zedong and his On Protracted War, theory aside, Nicaragua's General Sandino was one of the first to put guerrilla tactics into practice, which explains why the Sandinistas named themselves after him. If you think about it, guerrilla warfare itself has been around since ancient times. There's only so many ways a small group can upset a large army. There was a samurai in Japan who excelled in guerrilla warfare. No kidding. Tsunoki Masashige. He was a warrior who lived in the medieval era. He used unconventional tactics to help overthrow the Kamakura Shogunate. Like what? Trojan horse-style maneuvers and decoys to confuse the enemy. The best one was when the enemy was climbing the castle walls. He dumped boiling water and human excrement on them. Huh. Sounds great. Let's put it in the MSF playbook. You're not serious, are you, boss? Why not? We've got plenty of crap to unload. Uh, yeah. I'll think about it. Just add that to the, the strike, the strike thing that I can use, <laughs> L-strike thing. Um, let me, I turned my fan off because it was loud, but now I'm already sweating, so I need to see if I can dampen the noise a little bit. <laughs> Maybe that will be okay. Ah, uh, Baba. Yeah, that helped. Okay. I just have to get it off the actual desk so it's not vibrating. <laughs> the sun is going down, so it should get cooler as we continue, but it's still very hot in Texas. <laughs> What's wrong, Kaz? You sound beat. Yeah, the problems never seem to end around here. You should take a break. Share a cup of mate with the other guys. It'll give you a chance to connect with them. I wonder if Che and his men ever sat around and drank mate. I bet they did. Che was famous for his love of the stuff. Oh, Gross. Man, whoever thought of this was a genius. You can put it in a gourd and carry it around, and there's a special straw with a filter attached so you can drink it any time. That's not all. It's full of essential vitamins and minerals, <laughs> too. Nice to have in a guerrilla war when food is short. Yeah. Wish I had a chance to share some with a blonde Parisienne when I was out hiking. Well, how do you know about that? It takes a thief. Or should I say it takes a snake to know one? Snake.
The year the Cuban Revolution was won, Che visited Japan as a member of an economic delegation. While he was there, he visited Hiroshima. You know, Hiroshima. Since he was there to discuss... Maybe I should mention... Hiroshima wasn't part of the original itinerary. Some said the Ministry of Foreign Affairs didn't want to let him go, but he went anyway. He snuck out of his hotel... And I'll wait until he's done. <laughs> Gorilla style. Sounds like Che, all right. He visited the Peace Memorial Museum and the Atomic Bomb Survivors Hospital. Apparently, it gave him quite a shock. As a doctor, it must have been painful for him to see how the victims suffered. Nukes destroy everything. He was quoted as saying, They put you through this, and still you do whatever America says. Those words really hit me hard. Especially when I think of my mom. He said something else, too. Let us all love Hiroshima and its people. I can believe it. Che never managed to numb himself to other people's pain. That's why people loved him. And why he died. I feel like I should probably date this for anybody who might watch this in the future. Um, Shinzo Abe got assassinated a few days ago, and Kojima was misidentified as the assassin. So now <laughs> listening to all these tapes uh, of him celebrating Shay. I can't get the image of, <laughs> of him next to the painting on, like, the Greek news out of my head. It's kind of funny, but also kind of fucked up <laughs> that they did that. That bandana you're always wearing, that thing's a real antique. Ever think about getting a new one? This one's fine. Come on, we can't have our boss wearing a raggedy old thing like that. It was a gift, okay? It wouldn't be right to get rid of it. It was. Okay, then. But speaking of which, Chase supposedly had a black scarf he used to take everywhere with him. A scarf? One of his comrades gave it to him when he broke his arm in battle. Che used that silk scarf as a sling, and the comrade who gave it to him became his second wife. Alida, right? Even after his arm healed up. He never went anywhere without that scarf. What about you? You get that bandana from someone special? No, nothing like that. It's... it's important to me. That's all. You were saying Japan has a peace constitution, too. Yep. Japan renounced war in Article 9 of its constitution. Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order. The Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as a means of settling. I believe this is the thing that they're trying to change at the moment. So. Well, they've been trying to change it for a while, but, you know. Will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized. <laughs> You know it by heart. Some things you never forget. Impressive. There were some parts I didn't quite get, though. Like the whole means of settling conflicts thing. Yeah, that's been the subject of debate. Whether or not it forbids any and all use of force. The current constitution was originally drawn up under the Allied occupation. The first draft was even submitted by Allied GHQ. So naturally, there are some who feel the Constitution was imposed on Japan by foreigners. Things like that are never simple. Same Which is fail. I guess. One thing's for sure, though. Not having an army let Japan focus on economic recovery after the war. In that sense, <laughs> it's the same as Costa Rica. International politics podcast, pretty, pretty much. Also, hello, Onei-chan. How are you doing today? Kaz, you were in the Japanese Self-Defense Force, right? I thought that Article 9 you were talking about earlier prevented Japan from having an army. Yeah, and that's another subject of controversy. The Self-Defense Force is an organization for the purpose of defense. Article 9 of the Constitution does not deny Japan's right to self-defense. Therefore, the SDF is constitutional. That's Tokyo's official stance. Uh, sounds complicated. Call it what you will. It's a distinctly Japanese way of interpreting things. How am I doing? I'm 
hot. <laughs> Let me actually check to see if the the temperature has changed any since I began. Nope, still a hundred. I'm hot and last yesterday I had like a horrible splitting migraine that I'm hoping doesn't happen today. But besides that, I'm doing pretty good. The US has military forces stationed in Japan, right? Right. Even I'll probably take multiple breaks this week just so I can have time to like cool off. Security treaty, unlike Costa Rica. Part of it stems from the occupation, but Japan also occupies a key strategic position from America's perspective. It's next door to the Soviet Union and close to China. By that I mean multiple breaks a stream. Integral to the security of Pacific Asia. For all the streams this week <laughs> is what I mean. Against communism. What about for Japan? Thank you for the Cheers. The U.S. only gave it back to Japan two years ago, <sighs> and American bases are still concentrated on it. It's a heavy burden for the Okinawans to bear. Then why don't they scrap the treaty? Lots of reasons. There's the imbalance of power with the U.S., of course, and if Japan pulled out, they'd be losing the nuclear umbrella America provides. And as for whether the JSDF could defend the country after the Americans left, I really couldn't say. Costa Rica is in a similar situation. They depend on the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, the so-called Rio Pact. So, the countries with peace constitutions end up having to rely on other countries' armies. Kind of ironic. On the flip side, not everybody in America is satisfied with it either. Some people argue Japan is freeloading off America's security guarantee. And you know how Japan's industrial exports are making inroads in the States. Yeah, I've got a Japanese camera myself. Best damn camera around. Japan's low defense spending allows it to invest more in economic recovery and expand its share of the American market. That's a bitter pill for Americans to swallow. Would this be... I forget what exact time this game takes place. Would this be before or after... the bubble in Japan? This is seventies, so probably like leading into it. I think. <laughs> I think I'm terrible with with time. You know that today Japan is under the American nuclear umbrella. Right. The U.S. vowed to retaliate against any country that launches a nuclear strike against an allied country. That promise deters nuclear attacks against America's allies, hence the term nuclear umbrella. But suppose the Russians nuke Tokyo. Would America really nuke Moscow in return? Probably not. The Soviet Union would undoubtedly retaliate. Would Washington really be willing to risk having a bomb dropped on itself in order to avenge Japan? I'm not so sure. Especially not nowadays. But Japan, after all these years? It's not that. I just... Uh, to be honest, I'm not convinced either. But Moscow faces the same dilemma. Maybe Washington wouldn't retaliate on Japan's behalf. 70s when so in the game is probably wasn't until the mid-80s. Okay. You're saying Moscow wouldn't want to risk being attacked either. The whole concept of nuclear... I know it was the 80s, but I wasn't sure if it was like early or late 80s. Get down to it. It's all smoke and mirrors. And I only know that because of Yakuza Zero. <laughs> That's not true. I've actually read a bit about, like, like, Japanese sociology and stuff, but... Japan shall not possess, manufacture, or allow the introduction of nuclear weapons into Japan. Those are the three non-nuclear principles set forth by the Japanese government. Allow the introduction? That's funny. Some of the U.S. warships that visit Japanese ports are armed with nukes. Or are you going to tell me they transfer them at sea onto other ships every time they visit? You raise a good point, Snake. But the Japanese government doesn't recognize it as such. The introduction of nuclear weapons into Japanese territory would need to be agreed upon in advance. America hasn't made any such agreements. 
Therefore, they aren't bringing nukes into Japan. That's the official excuse. That's <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Sound like much of an excuse to me. I don't blame you. Keep in mind, though, Japan suffered actual nuclear attacks. Anti-nuke sentiment there runs deeper than you think. I suppose the government's not really in a position to admit that sort of thing. You could find a better way to excuse that. Just say, like, n no introduction into... Like, not officially adding nukes to Japan's armaments. armaments. Instead of just, like, lampshading it like that. <laughs> So tell me, Kaz, how's the self-defense force here in Like, other people's nukes are fine, they just can't own them, would make more sense. It's not configured for aggression against other countries. It's what you'd call exclusive defense. Exclusive defense? It's the fundamental strategic posture of the JSDF. No preemptive attacks. Only the minimum defensive action necessary after an enemy attacks. Anything defined as self-defense, then. The JSDF originated as the National Police Reserve. Back then, American forces stationed in Japan were being sent over to fight in the Korean War. So in a sense, the NPR was filling a gap. Police, huh? Reminds me of the Costa Rican Civil Guard. Yeah, exactly. They're also dispatched to provide disaster relief. The year before I joined, they had a hell of a time trying to rescue some buses that got hit by landslides. I actually didn't know that, that they sold as, like, actual, literal cops. I guess that makes sense, though. Because the only other option would be that they started as the army, but that doesn't really exist anymore. So why'd you quit the JSDF? Because I didn't have a reason to be in Japan anymore. A reason? My mom had died three years earlier, so I didn't have to care for her anymore. With her gone, there was no point hanging around in Japan. Yeah, but a man with your talents could have risen pretty high in the ranks, I imagine. I don't know what they made of me. Could be it actually alienated me from the brass. And personally, I could never get used to the idea of exclusive defense. Meaning? On a strategic level, I can see how a country could go with the exclusive defense model used by the JSDF. And I've got nothing against my fellow soldiers who believe in it. On a tactical level, though, it just rubbed me the wrong way. To put it simply, I was itching for a real fight. <laughs> I figured. And I felt as long as I was in the JSDF, I'd never be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with my father, who was in the U.S. Army. Seeing Yukio Mishima's suicide didn't help either. Yukio Mishima? The guy who wrote the Temple of the Golden Pavilion? The way he questioned the status quo hit me. Uh, no idea. But it did get me thinking, that's for sure. I'll have to look that one up, I guess. Don't forget to give the MSF staff assignments. Where you place people will determine how Mother Base grows. Right. That goes for me, too. Assign me wherever you think is best. You? I thought you were second in command. Don't worry, I've got that covered. But MSF is still small, and I don't have the leisure of sitting around on my butt all day. <sighs> I see your point, but... Not to brag or anything, but I kick ass at whatever job you gave me. Put me in the area you want to focus on developing most. I'll take real good care of the staff there. Easy, cuz. Life's funny sometimes, isn't it? What brought that on? We first met as enemies on the battlefield. And now here we are, fighting side by side. You mean Columbia? Yeah. After I quit the JSDF. I made my way there and got myself a position as a drill sergeant for a band of revolutionaries. Despite the fact that I'd never seen a day of combat. I see you had the gift for talking business in Spanish even back then. Oh, come on, stop it. You're making me blush. Unlucky for me, though, you were in the service of the Colombian army. I remember it like it was yesterday. It all happened in an instant. You guys ambushed us and half my unit was taken out. My mind went totally blank. I couldn't keep it together. My whole unit was wiped out, and I was left half-dead from a bomb blast. Then, as I was leaving, you yelled out at me, 
I came all the way from Japan to be here. My place is on the battlefield. Then you asked for my help, saying, I want to be the one to end it. I remember being surprised that there were still samurai in Japan. You guys came over to me. I had a grenade hidden under me. But even then, you were too fast. The second I pulled the pin, you grabbed the hand I was using to hold the grenade with both palms. I didn't want it to go off. I'd heard samurai were a proud bunch. I wanted to know why one of them would stoop so low as to try to take his opponent with him. And I said, I'll never lose again. We'll never lose again. Yeah. We'll do whatever it takes, but we'll never be beaten again. Then, I passed out from the blood loss. When I woke up, I was in your camp's infirmary. Stuck it seems like Milo just kind of has an issue with pride, honestly. You swallowed your pride and fought with everything you had. I just didn't want to lose. You found a way to fight back, even in the face of death, even when you knew you were going to die. That's the mark of a true warrior. It's not about gain and loss, or victory and defeat. I looked at the way you lived your life and saw the path I needed to take. As a warrior, well, I never knew that. And that's why you... I realized then that the battlefield doesn't only divide people into allies and enemies. Sometimes it tells you more than just who's an ally or who's an enemy. Sometimes it helps reveal your true comrades. Like you and me, huh? That's right. And two years later... Now kiss. <laughs> You've probably heard this a million times, Snake, but you should always avoid combat with the enemy when possible. Right. We're outnumbered and in unfamiliar territory. We won't survive long in a straight fight, even with you on our side. I know. Avoiding combat is rule number one in a sneaking mission. That's no right. fight is a straight fight when Snake is involved. Only when necessary, using hit-and-run tactics to cripple them. It's the essence of guerrilla warfare. you a favor snake uh, if you ask nicely to make Emma come on we need to do some recruiting yeah what's your point I want you to avoid killing enemy soldiers as much as possible and send them back using Fulton recovery not much we can do with a corpse except give it a funeral obviously put him to sleep knock him out hold him up even and if you do have to fight try to leave them near death instead of dead and then use the Fulton recovery system Sounds easy enough. You know what would be really nice, though? If we had a way to Fulton recover anybody at any time. <laughs> you can steal items from soldiers by putting them to sleep or knocking them out and then doing a body. Why is the tutorial stuff, like, last in the list? And press the action button when you see the icon. Or you can sneak up on them from behind and do a holdup. It also works if the soldier's near death. Keep in mind, though, if you wait too long, you'll have a dead soldier instead of a dying one. And you can't do a body check if you're holding the Fulton recovery device either. So don't try. Don't carry any more gear than you need. If you try and stuff your entire arsenal into your backpack, it'll be too heavy and your mobility will be impaired. You'll only be hurting yourself. I know. Take only what you need. Every rookie knows that. You can check the weight of your gear before heading out. So make sure you do. Got it. I honestly didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> I haven't been I haven't been paying attention to that. Even a born warrior like you gets hand tremor snake. It happens even when you're full of stamina, and it only gets worse when you're tired, especially with larger, heavier weapons. Obviously, you'll get better aim crouching than you will standing. And when you use a scope, setting your sights on a single point will gradually give you a more precise aim. As we develop better weapons at Mother Base, though, you may gain access to new, low-tremor versions of the same guns. So if you expect the shakes to be a problem, you might want to put some resources into R&D. I'll keep it in mind. Then again, the more you use a weapon, the more your hands get used to it. Sometimes it pays to be faithful to your gun. Choosing the right uniform is crucial. Pick one that matches the mission objective and your own combat style. Okay, <laughs> thanks. 
Jungle fatigues are made for jungle combat. They provide decent protection and let you carry a fair number of weapons. Your standard uniform, basically. The distinguishing factor is that your camo index will vary a lot, depending on the area. Wear a pattern that makes you blend in with your surroundings, and your camo index goes up. Wear something that clashes, and you'll stick out like a sore thumb. Pick the right pattern for the occasion. Sigurd used to lecture me on it all the time. <laughs> Kaz is like, who? <laughs> specialized uniform for stealth missions. It provides excellent camo in any stage. Even better, you won't make a sound when you walk. Ooh, so I won't need to tiptoe all the time. And to top it off, it also makes your wounds heal faster. The fabric exerts... Oh, okay. I didn't realize the different suits had, like, tech. Not bad little trick. The battle dress uniform is the opposite of the sneaking suit, in that it's specialized for combat. It lets you carry plenty of weapons and ammo, and provides excellent protection. Not the best choice for sneaking, but if you feel like playing one-man army, this is the uniform of choice. Hmm, looks pretty damn heavy. It is. You won't be able to move as fast with it on, meaning it's not good for running away either. Keep that in mind. Naked. That's exactly what you are with this uniform. The pants are the same as the jungle fatigues. Obviously, since you're exposing your bare skin, your defense and camo index are going to be low. On the plus side, it's so light you can move around quicker. Uh, good for showing off muscles, too. Hey, Snake. I heard they gave you your old code name because you used to run around with your shirt off. Is that true? Don't believe everything you hear. They called me naked because I went in without gear or food. I had to procure everything on site. You <laughs> you into the jungle without even a pair of pants? On a halo jump from 35,000 feet? Sweet Jesus, you are a legend. You're busting my balls, aren't you, Kaz? Little bit, yeah. Hilarious. That does confirm, though, that Snake did walk around shotless. That's just not why they called him that. <laughs> That's just a, a happy coincidence, I guess. Cooperative operations, or co-ops for short, is the term for taking on missions in teams of two or more. The basic co-ops unit is a two-man cell. Even a single teammate is great to have in enemy territory. And there are actually quite a few things you can't do by yourself. You can help each other climb walls, divide up mission roles. On the other hand, if one of you is spotted, the other one's screwed too. And it's kind of tough for two people to hide in one small space. Good point. But what's more important than anything is how close you are to your comrades. Well said. Working as a two-man cell can make the mission easier or harder, depending on how well you work together. It's also good to note that if you've got a clear, specific objective, it can be to your advantage to use an even bigger team. That said, teams of three or more run a much greater risk of being spotted. Yeah. In a sneaking mission, the fewer people you have, the easier it is to get around. They really should have added co-ops to... five. In co-ops, you can trade weapons and equipment with your teammates. You can also display your teammates' inventories from your weapon or... I feel like it would suit that game pretty well. Of course. Ammo, sure. How about life? That also shared. Yep. You all sink or swim together. Your teammate dies, you die. You need to be within a certain distance of each other to swap items. Yeah, I know. I've been in this business so long, I can virtually see that distance. Looks kind of like a ring in my head. That's why you're the boss. Okay, we'll call it the co-op ring. And entering the ring will be called going co-op in. None of this shit really matters since I can't do co-op, but again, maybe, maybe there'll be something interesting sprinkled in. During a mission, you can assume what we'll call the Snake Formation. Same as your code name, but probably not standard operating procedure for a guy who specializes in going solo. Damn right. There's only room for one snake. In co-ops, though, it's a highly effective formation. The signal for Snake Formation is to tap your teammate on the shoulder. Hmm. 
can't form up until you're close enough to reach out and touch someone. Entering snake formation is called going snake in. When you're snake in, the soldier at the front of the line controls movement. The soldiers in back focus on scouting and attack. Just because your heart stops doesn't mean you're dead immediately. Right. The heart just circulates blood through the body. But stopping it does cut oxygen supply to the brain. You'll be dead soon after. Which is why we have CPR. Let's say your heart does stop. If someone performs CPR before your brain cells die, you can recover. In co-ops, when the life gauge drops to zero, it means you're in a near-death state. You won't be able to move or anything else. Performing CPR on near-death teammates can bring them back into action. Of course, performing CPR in the middle of battle isn't exactly safe. You're leaving yourself exposed. Even so, in co-ops, you and your teammates are all in the same boat. Don't think you can get away with leaving one of them behind. I wouldn't think of it. And I'd expect them to do the same for me. If you let all your teammates die during- I bet co-op was fun. Be nobody left to the maps in this game were kind of small to really account for it, but... There's not many, like, co-op stealth games these days that are worth playing. <laughs> that I know of. Building trust with your teammates is essential to success in co-ops. That goes without saying. I'm not gonna let somebody I can't trust cover my ass. The measure of that trust is called camaraderie. Think of it as an indicator of how strong your bond is with your co-op's teammates. The friendlier you act toward them, the greater your camaraderie. Give me an example. Your camaraderie will be higher if you're co-op in than standing apart. Saving a teammate's life with CPR also strengthens your bonds with them. Things like hitting a teammate with friendly fire will cause your I miss... Like, asymmetrical multiplayer stuff is popular nowadays, kind of. They really need to bring back the multiplayer mode that was in, um... But be careful. If you keep taking new people with um, missions, your Splinter Cell. There's like mercenaries versus spies. Mercenaries are like an FPS control scheme and spies were like a typical Splinter Cell thing. That was fun. I feel like that would be popular nowadays. They co op back in the day and the boss fights were great. Snaking was fun, but could be old. Honestly, if I had a co op partner last time, I probably would have beat the boss pretty easily. <laughs> Having double the ammo would help a lot. You and your teammates will start to get in sync. In sync? That's right. Stay still together and you'll enter snake sync mode. The synergy will give you a boost in performance. You'll move faster, recover faster, and have better camouflage. In other words, we're at our best when we're in the same groove. You got it. If you've got a big task ahead, can't hurt to take some time to get in sync. Like I said before, the benefits you get from Snake Sync depend on your camaraderie. I hear ya. It's a lot easier knowing you've got someone you know and trust covering your back. Let's you focus that much more on what you have to do. If camaraderie represents how much your teammates trust you, then heroism shows how high your reputation is. Heroism? That's right, heroism. Your reputation affects your ability to recruit new members to MSF. Every time heroism gets me a, a new soldier, they'll shit, and I have to file them immediately, so... How do I get this heroism thing to go up? Lots of ways. Complete tough missions. Avoid unnecessary bloodshed. And don't get caught by the enemy like a deer in headlights, or you'll never be heroic. Also, getting out there and attacking the enemy in co-ops will boost your reputation among your teammates. Of course, it'll get the enemy gunning right for you, too. But don't sweat it. Be yourself. Be the boss. From where I'm standing, you're plenty heroic already. Aww. Seems the R&D team's been busy working on co-ops only weapons. Co-ops only? Like a gun with extreme firepower, but only when two people fire it at once. I hear it's still in the concept stage. Uh, I know some rocket launches need two people to operate, but a co-ops only weapon... 
Hey, if they come up with something good, you'll have that much more reason to go co-ops. Why don't you check in and see how they're doing every once in a while? In co-ops, maintaining close communications with your teammates is crucial. Absolutely. Losing track of each other on the battlefield is a good way for a unit to get itself wiped out. Enemy positions, orders, distress calls. When communications break down, you get picked off one by one. Now about co-ops comms. Co-ops comms? It's a radio system for communicating with co-ops teammates. First press the start button to open the menu. Then select co-ops comms. After that, press one button to choose a category, then another button to select the actual message. So basically, you use different combinations of two buttons to send different messages. <sighs> Easy enough. You can set which messages go with which buttons during mission prep. Uh, sounds like it's going to be a pain to send messages until I get used to it. Then why don't you assign co-op's comms to the select button? That should make things a little quicker and easier. Just go to Select button under Options. I'll give it a try. Kotodama effect. Okay. Snake, you familiar with the Japanese word Kotodama? Mm -hmm. Kotodama. Unfortunately, there's no direct equivalent in English. But to keep it simple, let's call it a sort of battle cry. Battle cry, huh? Right. But Kotodama is actually a deep Japanese concept. Koto means word, and Dama means spirit. It signifies that words have power that affect our reality. <laughs> uh, are you feeling okay? <laughs> I guess I made it sound kind of like mumbo jumbo, huh? <laughs> Seriously, though, haven't you ever felt energized when a teammate cheered you on? Or no. the way around? Ever had your legs cut out from under you by a thoughtless remark? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Words can have a powerful mental effect on people. Same goes for co-op's comps. Offering praise to somebody could make them run faster than usual. Or make somebody who thinks they're done for get up and fight again. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay? I get the picture. So it works in reverse, too. The powers of words are many and varied. Try using <coughs> it yourself. Snake, about cardboard boxes. <laughs> it feels kind of weird me explaining this stuff to you, but there have been a few recent developments. That was a weird noise, the snake. So just to be safe, here goes. Go on. You can do much more with the box than just hide under it. You can put it someplace and leave it there. <laughs> you can get on top of it and use it to reach high places. Oh. Or hide from the enemy in its shadow. Mm -hmm. I like what I'm hearing so far. And that's not all. You can even put items in it and send them co-op's teammates. Really? I never thought of any of that. Damn. Is there anything a cardboard box can't do? Every soldier should have one. Yeah, well, don't get too excited. This isn't exactly what they were made for. Can you imagine don't you if Snake knew about, like, duct tape? Big side. You're right. I bet two people could fit under one box if they packed in tight enough. They call them love boxes. Love boxes. Of course, you don't need a love box to fit two people inside. Any box of similar size will do. Like, if he can get so much done with a cardboard box, if he really wanted to, he could be like a MacGyver type character. Up to oh. two people can fit inside a cardboard box. Tell me how. Move close to a box with a teammate inside, and an icon will appear. Then press the action button. You'll stay inside as long as the action button is pressed. So, same as snake formation, huh? Exactly the same. In fact, when you put on a cardboard box when snake in, both of you can climb inside. <sighs> a box big enough to hold me and my buddy. These are fine times we live in, hey, Kaz? Yeah. Sure, boss. Just... Undeniably gay. Just undeniably. <laughs> Snake and MacGyver would get along well. I actually don't know anything about MacGyver as, like, a character. I don't know his, like, motivations. Snake, about 
that cassette player Galvez was carrying. What about it? That was no Russian imitation. It was the real deal. A prototype developed by a Japanese company. Get out of here. It's true. It had the Sony logo on it. The product name is Walkman. Walkman. It's a revolutionary new concept. Music you can listen to on the go. You can take it with you when you leave the house. I gave it a listen. And you wouldn't believe how good the sound quality is for something so tiny. Didn't 8 tracks exist by now? The technology that must have gone into it. And that tape is equally amazing. The treble range is clearly superior to any other cassette ever made. Stylish, too. How'd Galvez get his hands on a model that's not even out yet? Beats me. It's not the kind of thing I'd expect some stodgy Soviet to be into. Hmm, me neither. Tell you what, though, it's a fine piece of work. It'll let me listen to my music when I want, where I want. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear you say that, but I have to agree. Me? I'm a recording freak, and I always used to laugh at the idea of a portable player. But now that I've seen it in action, I've changed my mind. Being able to take your music with you, this could be the start of a revolution in music. Could be. I'm having the guys at Mother Bay study and analyze it. Who knows? They might be able to come up with something even better. It sure is nice of Walmart to pay us for saying Walmart so many times. <laughs> type of enemy you'll be seeing most is the type that patrols and guards a specific operational area. For the sake of convenience, Amanda's crew calls the outdoor ones patrolmen and the indoor ones guards. They might look like they're just out for a stroll, but don't be fooled. They're sharper than they look. All of their senses are finely honed. Normally, they'll patrol along fixed routes, but when the alert level is raised, They'll assume a more efficient alert posture and focus on defending specific points. That's bad for you. Obviously, they can hold their own in combat. And with body armor, it'll be even harder to take them down. If they're wearing a bulletproof helmet, you can forget about one-shot kills. Just a heads up. You'll need to be smart about using camo and pick your routes. The most important thing is to avoid detection. When the enemy spots you and goes on alert, they may call in a backup strike team. These assault teams are heavily armed, well-trained, and highly dangerous. Amanda's crew calls them commandos. Unlike the patrolmen, these guys will actively, relentlessly track and hunt you down like hounds. Hate those guys. Hounds to hunt a former fox have. Bring it on. They won't give up easily even if they lose sight of you. They'll clear out any likely hiding places they come across. So don't get too comfy in one spot, or you might get caught again. Keep your eyes fixed on them and what they're doing. Also, be aware the commando gear includes body armor, so don't think you can deal with them by going in guns blazing. All I've got to do is find an exposed weak point, and... Exactly. I mean, shotguns walk too. Shotguns just send them flying. <laughs> There's one type of commando you really need to watch out for, and that's the kind toting shotguns. They can take a few hits and still keep charging you. And believe me, you don't want them closing in between those shotgun blasts. When they start charging, you need to stop them immediately. Use something with serious stopping power. We've also confirmed that some of the enemies specialize in ambushes. Amanda's crew calls them scouts. They'll blend themselves in with the terrain and the vegetation. Then, when they see you, they'll swoop in. They fight pretty much like commandos, and will use clearing techniques to flush you out. In addition to wielding normal weapons, the scouts also carry wires. Uh, sounds like these guys know their CQC. Could be. We've been getting reports of CQC attacks being blocked by wires. Stay alert. Scouts are outfitted with camouflage to help them hide. Some of them look kind of weird, like they've got seaweed growing all over them. 
Ah, ghillie suits. Not much difference between them and any other scout in terms of combat ability, but it does make them harder to spot. I'm sure it does. You've come across these before? Yeah, the Soviet Union. The first time, it took me a full hour to find the guy and take him out. Kaz, do you know what they shine? <laughs> like how? Like, from their heads. Their heads? How about their hair? They have a lot of it. What are you talking about? How the hell would I know? How about a parrot? Did anybody hear a parrot squawk? A parrot? Look, Snake, you're talking to the wrong Snake guy. is just like having flashbacks. <laughs> You're not making any sense to begin with. Never mind. It's a long story. I'll figure it out another way. Forget about it. Yeah, I'll do that. Anyway, God, the end is still to these surprise encounters. one of the best boss fights ever made. <laughs> out there where enemy soldiers are deployed in multiple layers for extra coverage. More than a few of those will be attacking you from a distance. It's a shame quiet is not as good. <laughs> they tried to kind of do it again, but it really didn't work as well. Enemy tanks, armored vehicles, and attack choppers are always accompanied by a combat squad. The soldiers aren't particularly tough on their own. What makes them formidable is how well they work together as a team. As if you didn't have enough to worry about with a machine. Good. I like a challenge. Yeah. We'll see how you feel when you actually have to face them in battle. Snake, whatever you do, don't let them surround you. The last thing you need is to get pushed into the vehicle's kill zone. And pay attention to what your enemies say to each other. You can improve your chances by figuring out what they're planning and using it to preempt their movements. You don't always have to go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to win a fight. Think like a gorilla. Got it. Snake, go monkey mode. Why is this one not? Enemies carrying shields can be a real pain in the ass. To hear Amanda's help. Trying to fight those bastards while they sit behind their shields taking pistol shots at you is enough to make you want to rip your hair out. Get around and flank them if you can. You might want to try blinding them with smoke or stun grenades first. Also, armor-piercing rounds should make it a little easier to punch through their shields. Use them if you got them. We know there are variations in the kinds of gear patrolmen and commandos wear, especially the body armor. Our scouts report that an enemy's defense and firing accuracy are directly proportional to how heavy their gear is. Hmm. Those must be the guys with the highest combat skills. They can fight in heavier gear without their performance suffering. Supposedly, it's pretty easy to tell the difference in gear just by looking. So remember, use extra caution when dealing with enemies wearing heavy gear. I think, hopefully, this should be the last ca last Kaz cause. When you meet an enemy, get a hey. look at what they're carrying. It can make or break your chances in battle. No, okay, <laughs> still got more. Enemies carrying handguns and shotguns will try and get in close. That makes them dangerous, but at the same time, easier to hit. Keep your wits about you, and you can turn a threat into an opportunity. Enemies carrying assault rifles and machine guns will usually fire at you from farther away. Use whatever cover you can find, then return fire with you know, place shots of your own. This seems obvious to me. Like, oh yeah, you have guns in multiple ranges. But I guess back in the day. Don't expect enemies carrying sniper rifles. Not all video games had that concept. They'll be constantly moving from place to place looking for an opening to snipe at you. By this point, I think most did, but... Eye for an eye, two for a two. It probably still helps some people to be reminded. Stay out of their line of sight, and when they expose themselves, take them down. Okay. That's all of Miller, but we still have all of these. <laughs> I 
And we haven't got um, Strange Love yet, so we'll have to listen to those probably after after we kill Peace Walker. This is, this is what I knew we were going to do today, so. And I don't mind listening to Terra Strong talk. Uh, he was nuts about a lot of stuff. The animals and the peace loving people. That is what I want to say. How I feel. Fuck Columbus. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. Central America. Sure, we had coup and dictators and all, but never a total meltdown. That is, until 26 years ago. The Civil War. Yeah. I understand you lost your grandparents. It started with a dispute over alleged fraud in the presidential election. What I do not understand is why friend turned against friend when they could have talked it out instead. Yeah, that would have been nice. <laughs> Even today, some buildings still have bully holes from the Civil War. A quarter century later, and it is a tragedy we Ticos cannot forget, must not forget. It was the year after the Civil War that the army was constitutionally abolished. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Web it is possible, but would they really bring in such a huge army just because of that? Part of our job is finding out. Exactly. Thanks. Peace. Subjects and then use them to build the foundations of peace. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I just never heard the UN had a university for peace before. Oh, that. Well, to be precise, it is still being set up. They have started conducting research, but the UN has not passed the necessary resolution yet. Professor Galvez couldn't wait that long. Oh, uh, right. Costa Rica abolished its army and has also hosted the Central American Court of Justice. It is the perfect place to build a university like ours. Don't you think? <laughs> There's just enough of it in though for me to only imagine this. That coffee you guys brought us is pretty damn good. Isn't it? Costa Rican coffee is the best. The Central Basin has all the right conditions for growing coffee. It is high in elevation. With steady temperatures and well-drained volcanic soil. The professor certainly seems attached to it. The coffee we drank on the boat coming over was awesome. It put him in such a terrible mood. How come I never God, she said coffee and now I want some. Because it gets bought up by wholesalers and mixed with beans from other countries. It is really a shame. 
such wonderful beings, and nobody knows they are from Costa Rica. Uh, we should launch an ad campaign or something. Right. I hope one day people will recognize Costa Rican coffee for what it is. I'm with you there. Are there any large-scale ruins in Costa Rica, Paz? There is a place east of Cartago called Guajabu. They have ruins there, but they're not especially big. Hmm. Not the place I'm thinking of. Any others? Well, if you go a little way across the border into Nicaragua, there is a place called La Fortaleza de la Inmaculada Concepción. That is the only famous one. Then what were those ruins I saw from Abanirasu? There are a lot of things we still do not know about Costa Rica's ancient civilization. There are giant stone spheres throughout the country. What they were used for is still a mystery. Is that true? Is that true or is that video game shit? Giant stone spheres sound cool. I want to see those. Uh, you said Costa Rica has no army, right? Correct. Article 12 of the Constitution declared that the army as a permanent institution is abolished. It does permit us to organize armed forces for national defense based on inter-American treaties. Only temporarily, then. In effect, yes. But in the years since the Constitution took effect, Costa Rica has not once raised an army. Buzz, how does your country defend itself without an army? Especially in a rough neighborhood like Central America. With the right kind of diplomacy. If we live up to our ideals and earn the respect of other countries, the international community will support us. The two times Nicaragua actually did invade, the conflict was resolved diplomatically under OAS auspices. It is real? Neat. I need to, I want to look that up. American <laughs> influence is unmatched, it is true. San Jose was critical of American policy at the time, but America supported us all the same. It was because we practiced peaceful diplomacy. That is what I like to see. That's one way to approach it, sure. But there are countries out there who will use force no matter how bad it looks. Maybe so. I know my way of thinking probably looks naive to you, but it is not like we expect peace without working for it. Diplomacy is a battle in itself, and we have to make the effort to seek out causes of misfortune and nip them in the bud. It was that kind of thinking that got me trapped in their base. <laughs> I'm not blaming you. You haven't done anything wrong. The army was abolished 25 years ago, the year after the Civil War. I learned about the sorrow of Civil War from a very young age. The futility of countrymen fighting each other. And the tragedy. Costa Rica learned the hard way. Probably the info to keep this up at this point. It decided to <laughs> into education instead. More teachers than soldiers was the slogan. Education is essential, no question. Even Che used to teach reading and writing in between guerrilla campaigns. Costa Rica was poor at the time. We did not have many resources. I suppose we had to pick one or the other. The military or the schools. Good thing they didn't pick the military, I guess? Hello, Mosaic. <laughs> I'm doing okay. I probably don't have to take a break after all of this to cool off. But besides that, I'm doing good. How are you? Kaz was telling me Japan has a peace constitution, too. That is right. Apparently, when Costa Rica was drafting its constitution, they looked to the Japanese as a model. Only, Japan's constitution renounces war itself. Unlike Costa Rica. But, Japan has a... I understandable. <laughs> that I do not get. I think I will ask Mr. Mueller about it next time I see him. He said he used to be in the JSDF. Huh. You're a curious one, are you? Don't study too hard. What was that you were saying? Peace is not the natural state of men. You said you learned it in school. That is right. They are the words of the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. 
With all the new cost fact, wanna hear? Sure. He wrote a book titled Perpetual Peace. Kant argued that That's not at all what I said, said close captains. <laughs> that we have to make it ourselves. How? That is what his book is about. Is the concept starting to sound interesting now? Not really. I belong in a more natural world. Is that so? My grandparents died in the Civil War. If only we had been at peace, they would not have lost their lives. You actually wish for war? It's not like I want to hurt innocent civilians. But if someone attacks you, what are you supposed to do? A country needs the strength to defend itself. Otherwise it faces invasion, oppression, political subjugation. If they would simply stop using force to tangle with each other, countries would not need force to defend themselves. And how would you guarantee that? I... Sorry, but you have to understand how the world works in order to protect the ones you love. That's not to say ideals aren't important, too. They are. You are right, Snake. Thanks. Peace. Uh, Ultra Beast Kate Honey using the rotten meat from corpses. Using the acidic saliva, they break down the meat, much like how flies do. And process it in their bodies to create the honey. Unlike most bees, they only make enough to survive, no extra. Would that mean... Would that mean that it's the honey would be a meat product, <laughs> technically? <laughs> I wonder if it's edible. Like, by humans. I'd try it. Costa Rica's forests are more diverse than you might expect. Not all of them are tropical rainforests. Described as smoky, salty, and unusually sweet. Yeah, I see what you mean. Smoky honey sounds good. An elevation and the temperature drops more than seven degrees. There are basically three types of forests. The lowlands are covered in tropical rainforests. The highlands by tropical cloud forests. And areas like a savory honey. A tropical dry forest. That sounds really good, actually. <laughs> the lowlands along the Caribbean coast are mostly covered by hot, humid tropical rainforests. What most people envision when they think of junk. The closely packed it probably isn't good for the species to take it. Probably not. Soak up the sun. Their shade makes it dark near the ground, so be careful. Of course, with so little light, few plants can grow on the ground. So it might actually be easier to walk. So even if you could photosynthesize, it wouldn't do you any good. Photosynthesize? People cannot do that. Hmm. Most people, anyway. I like how they keep bringing up the end. Honestly, if you cultivate it, if you like specifically cultivate the bees, it would probably be fine. Because I know people who produce honey are actually doing a pretty good thing by by keeping bees alive. So areas with a distinct dry season like the Pacific Coast, have tropical dry forests. During the dry season, the trees drop their leaves. It gives you a clearer they view. They do, yeah. But at the same time, there are fewer places to hide. So be careful. Sounds dull. It is not really. A lot of trees flower during the dry season, including my favorite, the Tabebuia. It has these amazingly vivid yellow flowers. Vulture bees are stingless. I would assume by the name that they are like big, scary bees. Like the kind that leave a bullet hole in you when they sting. <laughs> the cloud forests cover the central mountainous region of the country. They are perpetually shrouded in fog. You get wet just standing there. It is as if the entire forest is inside a cloud. Must make for poor visibility. It does. But beauty too. It is like being lost in some mystical green labyrinth. Mm, that makes sense. Get lost, that's okay. The forests are also home to lots of rare animals, especially bright colored frogs. They like the humidity. You know that butterfly painted on Peace Walker? Any idea what that is? It is a morpho. A Pallades morpho, if I'm not mistaken. Pallades morpho? 
Murphy is drinking a forty in a death basket. Oh. It has these gorgeous metallic blue wings that shimmer in the light. You can they look like hornets. You mean? I think I might have seen pictures of them. Aren't they like massive? Structural color. Morpho scales have tiny bumps on them that interfere with the light and make them look blue. The space between the bumps corresponds to the wavelength of the blue light. Let me see if I get this. I think those are the ones that are like on Mount Fuji, if I remember correctly. That is the principle. I heard somewhere it is being researched as a way to color cloth without dye. Think of the camouflage you could make with that. Is that all you can think of? Hey, it's important. What I don't get is why they'd put a butterfly on Peace Walker. Maybe because it looks pretty. I hope that's all it is. Native to South America. Hmm. What am I thinking of? What am I thinking of? Oh, apparently the ones I'm thinking of are just Japanese giant hornet, is what they're called, so... Costa Rica is said to have about 87,000 species <clears throat> of these things. That is about 5% of all the known species in the world. A tiny place like this? <laughs> as long as they wait for my demise. <laughs> protect that biological diversity. When diversity is lost, the environment weakens. Just look at the plantations. I think I know what you mean. It's like trying to assemble a unit from similar guys. It usually doesn't work out. Throw a few square pegs in there and everything falls into place. There are so many species here that a lot of them have not even been classified yet. I am hoping I can help do that someday. Kind of like a parataxonomist. Para... Say that again? Parataxonomist. Someone who helps a taxonomist. Oh. Huh. I thought you were going to say it had something to do with parachutes. <laughs> You're weird. Living bodies are too hard to wait for your eyes to decay and climb into the skull. I see. Do they nest in the body, or do they just consume it and then take it back to the, the hive? Because if they make the hive in the body, then that would be hard to cultivate. <laughs> the Development Corporation of Costa Rica, or CODESA, was established two years ago. Since President Odegaard was elected this year, the state has been putting a lot more effort into development. The corporate state, so to speak. Growth is good at all, but there is one thing that bugs me. What's that? I cannot help but wonder whether CODESA is not just a front for the CIA. You mean what the professor was saying about the CIA mercenaries posing as security guards? They were using CODESA as camouflage? I am worried that development is going to destroy the forest. But I do not suppose it has anything to do with this. Honestly, maggots are one of the few things that actually make me queasy when I see them. I have a pretty strong stomach for that kind of thing, but... That, that activates, like, innate, like, biological, biological reaction. My mother was the one who named me Pat. She said it was an expression of her wish that the country stay at peace. It is a pretty common name in Central America. My mother always used to tell me, never make war. Always help keep the peace. I remember. Your grandparents. Yes. They died in the Civil War. I think that is why my mother hated war so much. That's another thing you've got in common with Kaz. His mother named him Peace, too. See. Si. Because Japan also suffered through war. I think I know how Mr. Miller's mother felt. You like the peace sign, huh? See, si, as a gesture. 
It connects every peace-loving person. Here, you try it, Snake. Peace. No thanks, it doesn't suit me. Too bad for you. You know, the V in the peace sign comes from the V in victory. When did it start standing for peace? I am not completely sure, but I guess it came out of the protest movement against the Vietnam War. Oh, and do not turn your hand around when you do it, especially around British people. It is <laughs> so cool. Yeah, but they deserve it. So, you live alone now? No, not alone. I've been living in school dormitories since I started junior high. After my mother died, my relatives took me in, but they were not my real family. You didn't fit in there? In a way. My aunts were kind to me and all. But I know how difficult it must have been to suddenly have a child thrust into their lives. When you live with someone, there are no secrets. I could tell my being there was a burden on them. Hmm. Sounds like a rough childhood. I would not say that. I was lucky just to have people take me in. There were funnels living out in the streets because their mothers died. It is even worse in countries with frequent civil wars. So, who am I to complain about my childhood? You're a pretty tough kid, you know? Not at all. I am not strong at all. Playa del Alba means Beach of Dawn. The morning sun is so beautiful over the Caribbean. Beach of Dawn, huh? Perfect place to start a mission. The clear blue water, the white sand, the swaying palm trees. You cannot get more South American than here. It is paradise on Earth. Yeah, guess I should have packed my Hawaiian shirt. The coral reefs and mangrove forests protect the small fish in the area. Sea turtles come to lay their eggs on these beaches. We are not the only ones who enjoy this place. It is heaven for more than just humans. I was about to reference a song that nobody else would know. <laughs> There's a song called Vamos a la Playa that gets stuck in my head all the time. <laughs> By uh, La La Bionda, I think is how you say the name. It's an old Italian disco track. <laughs> Vamos a la playa, oh, 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 oh. It's about nuclear war. <laughs> it is your standard tropical rainforest. Everything you would imagine in a jungle. No sign of morning sun here. The foliage is too thick for direct sunlight to hit the floor. I do not know how easy it will be making your way through here. I'll be fine. This isn't my first trip to a jungle. The mercenary supply base is situated on elevated ground by the coast. I heard them call it Puerto del Alba, Port of Dawn. They have perfect visibility of the area from up there. We did our best to sneak in undetected, but one of the guards spotted us and we... What is it? I'm sorry. You'll have to ask Professor Galvez the rest. It's okay. You've been through a lot. I am sorry. I... I just cannot. You did great, Paz. I won't let your efforts go wasted. This is a tropical rainforest, just like Bosque del Alba. The temperature and humidity can be brutal. El Senegal means place of mud. No, uh, mud. Great. I'll watch my step. This area often gets flooded by the river. There are canals here and there carved out by water. You know, uh, good they haven't talked about it. But they will also make it harder for you to... But the mosquitoes must be insane. There should be a suspension bridge around there. In lowlands like this? The ground nearby is harder and higher than usual. It's kind of surprising that Snake has only ever really had, like, malaria. There might be another way to get... Like, once. I wouldn't want to run into someone on the bridge. The valley tends to be misty, so you might not be able to see the water from up there. Fall and it will leave more than a bump. I'll be careful. When a river floods an area, the banks can collapse, creating a marsh. You see a lot of them around here. 
I'll need to watch the noise my feet make in El Senegal. There is a marsh on the other side of the river, too. The suspension bridge will take you there. The river running through here is Rio del Jade, or the Jade River. Jade? Are there minerals around here? No. Anakin Snake Walker. You will have to go to Guatemala for Jade. Oh yeah, the codec is off today. Doesn't look all that. It should be off at least. Since we're we'll we listening to tapes. So the river is a little muddy. It will return to I didn't want to like interrupt <laughs> interrupt the tapes too much. Important means of transport around here. They are relatively calm. And there are plenty of canals along the coast, too. A boat would be more than enough to transport some good-sized cargo. Like a nuclear weapon. Hmm. We don't know enough yet. I'll keep looking. Thank you, Snake. There's a lot of banana cultivation along Costa Rica's Caribbean coast. The area is dotted with banana plantations. Bananas have been Costa Rica's main crop since they were introduced from Panama in the 19th century. They bring in a fair amount of foreign currency. A real fruta de oro, huh? <laughs> fruta? But exporting all those bananas require a ton of land. Hence, all the plantations. Clearing For the longest land. time I couldn't roll my eyes. I still kind of can't. <laughs> I do not know how good that is for Costa Rica in the end. Disease was rampant here about 20 years that would be a good gag if <laughs> snake hated indiana Panama disease that's a good enough pun that i think kojima would like it apparently it killed off almost all the banana species that used to grow here how could that happen cultivated bananas do not produce seeds you have to remove and transplant part of the stem yourself you plant them in the fields so you've got acres of identical plants see when one plant is infected the disease spreads quickly Species lacking genetic diversity become weak. They grow different bananas today. One said to be resistant to Panama disease. Last night, or yesterday, I spent the entire day uh, grinding in Fortnite to get the Indiana Jones skin that I'm never going to use. There was um, an Indiana Jones game I used to play on the original Xbox that I kind of want to stream at some point. I need to find a way to get it working. Costa Rica has several active volcanoes. Irasu being one of them. That's where Camino de Lava comes from, huh? The tropical dry forests around here are quite different from our rainforests. They lose their leaves in the dry season. Tropical forests are not all thick jungles. A few of them even have cacti. Some of Costa Rica's greatest assets are its diverse forests and natural landscapes. Oh, I think some of these... okay. Yeah, some of these are ones that I would be listening to before a mission. So that's why there's so many. Costa Rica has several active volcanoes. Irasu being one of them. That's where Camino de Lava comes from, huh? The tropical dry forests around here are quite different from our rainforests. They lose their leaves in the dry season. Tropical forests are not all thick jungles. A few of them even have cacti. Some of Costa Rica's greatest assets are its diverse forests and natural landscapes. Costa Rica got its first real railroads up and running about a hundred years ago. Their primary purpose was to move coffee harvested in the Central Basin to the Caribbean coast. They built railroads here a hundred years ago? That's hey, what's up, I'm tame. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mafia. Yeah. They started using the railroad Welcome back. Bananas too. They're still I hope everything went well. I hope you had a good, a good sesh. Aldea de los Despiertos means Village of the Awake. <laughs> We're still listening to tapes. <laughs> the area is littered with coffee fields, and there is a factory nearby. The villagers are fans of coffee, so... Nah, they don't get much sleep, huh? They've got a sense of humor, all right. I cannot believe they would take over a place like this and use it as a prison. It is unforgivable for both the CIA and the thugs they employ. 
All the villagers wanted was <laughs> real life law, what pretty much. The the right to crush them like that? They don't care about anyone's rights but their own. It's just the way some <laughs> the fantasy island, <laughs> fantasy uh, don't worry, kingdom just of Costa Rica. <laughs> Honestly, though, even though I think I would hate the the climate, there's something about like agricultural societies that I really like. I don't know if comfy is the right word, but like impressive <laughs> that I like a lot. <laughs> Makes me wish agriculture in America wasn't so fucked up. All to produce its drugs. It was famous one. For its fine beans. Mm. Cafe Tal Aroma Encantado. Enchanting aroma, huh? See, si. once we have thrown the mercenaries out of Costa Rica, I know it will make wonderful coffee again. And then you must come and try some snake. Sounds great. I wouldn't mind a cup of joe after all this is over. Oh, wait. What is wrong? No, I just remembered this guy I knew who wasn't big on coffee. English. Get rid of that muddy water and get a cup of black tea down your gob, he'd say. <laughs> that is too bad for him. It is delicious. As I said before, building railroads in Costa Rica was a dangerous job. A lot of men died, and sometimes they stopped work again. <laughs> this is one of those places. They had to cut through steep terrain, so when they finally made it through, they just built the rail terminal right there. I'm craving coffee, but I already had a, a monster today, so... Charming. I'm surprised the construction money didn't... I might get some anyway. Actually, it did. But the bananas helped complete it, so they say. You mean... the energy the workers got from... I do have some black tea, some... Oh, I suppose they do have plenty of vitamins. Mm. <laughs> no, no, no. I meant the money they got to finish it came from exporting bananas. Oh. But one thing is for certain. The owners of the railroads expanded into the banana trade after construction was completed. It's too interesting. <laughs> of banana cultivation in Costa Rica. I meant to say bitter. Oh, was it autocorrect? <laughs> Soy vanilla latte is a type of three bean soup. True. Um, I was gonna say. Thinking about building railroads in Costa Rica... Well, I guess it's not all mud. <laughs> if they had to go through, like, the muddy areas, that would be a huge endeavor. Because I remember, like, learning some stuff about when people were, like, colonizing Alaska and trying to build roads, and they just couldn't do it because of all the mud. I wonder if... Ooh. Big bad only I can donated one dollar towards a coffee fund. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wonder if, if Costa Rica had similar issues. Coffee smell great, but I don't like bitter. I mean that's when you just get like a like a like a latte or like a mocha type thing that has a lot of milk and milk and chocolate in it. Snakes. To the north of the village is a bridge that crosses a hydraulic pipe. Though normally the bridge is not used by people. If you spend like ten dollars on one of those one of those um Starbucks coffees you can get at the store. They are hydroelectric pipes. I wonder if they run into Irasu's crater lake. Normally they would build a reservoir at the bottom of the valley. Thank you thank you again for the for the tip on a John. I really do appreciate it. It really is the point that if it's more chocolate than coffee, it's just chocolate. True, but yeah, it's about balance. Whenever I have coffee, if I want to like make it last, I'll drink it black. But sometimes, if I want to want to hurry up and have the caffeine, I'll add milk. Has that bitter coffee aftertaste? Yeah, you want to have at least some of the coffee flavor still in though. But if you, like, really hate coffee, then obviously you don't want that. <laughs> Chocolate is bitter, too. True. But typically, 
typically in America, it's going to be like milk, milk chocolate. You should be able to see across the Iwazu mountain range from there. There are not as many big trees at that elevation. I don't really like hot black tea. If I'm having hot tea, I would rather have green. It'll be tough to hide up there. You're not thinking about the scenery right now, are you? Not while I'm surrounded by bad guys. You should have seen it when the country was at peace. I know you would have been impressed. Well, that'll be our reward for a successful mission. Sound good? One. Thank you. Black tea with a lot of sugar in it. That's just like southern. <laughs> That's just the southern iced tea. There is an old fort around there. What is it, boss? You sound upset. Well, you see, it was built during the Civil War. Let me guess. Disputes between Costa Rica's political parties escalated into all out conflict. See. Si. Conflict that cost my grandparents their lives. The most senseless sort of war. Countrymen mindlessly slaughtering their own. That fort is a reminder of that senselessness. Mm, sadly ironic, given who's occupying it now. That war was the reason Costa Rica abolished the army. Please, Nick, get them out of our country. I intend to. Black tea is good. Um, people like to shit on southern black tea as being oversweetened, but most people I know either don't sweeten it a whole lot or just don't sweeten it at all. Like, I'm fine drinking unsweetened black tea, unsweetened iced tea. The people who add, like, more sugar than tea are typically Typically kind of hoity-toity, in my opinion. <laughs> I feel like most, like, rural people are fine drinking it unsweetened. I don't think it's the real stuff. Like, it's not homemade. I mean, even stuff we drink is like, oh, you just get a bunch of, like, Lipton <laughs> and put it, put it in a big thing. thinking building a power plant at the top of the mountain with no river to replenish the water. Green tea is fine, but it's, it's hit or miss sometimes. This were an ordinary power plant, but the plan called for a pumped storage power plant. Pumped storage power plant? Oh! oh. That too. What is that? It is a facility that generates I'm okay. electricity <laughs> by pumping water up to the lake, then letting it run back down. Huh. Seems Sisyphean to me. If they turned the water into electricity as soon as they had pumped it up, sure. But a pumped storage plant acts as a kind of battery. A battery? For instance, they could pump at night when there is surplus electricity. I wish and for I could memorize that meme. <laughs> extra power during the day, they can generate it using water. <laughs> 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 it's a little more difficult. Than just out Guess she doesn't the kiss ya. That's all I know. <laughs> Costa Rica won't have enough electricity to meet its needs. Right now, there is no surplus. Maybe that's what put the brakes on the project. Must have played right into the CIA's hands. This earth is a tropical cloud forest, continually covered in a thick mist. It is quite a mystical place. Selva de la Leche. Forest of milk. Yeah. I can barely see in front of me. There you go again. The forest is basically sitting in a cloud. So of course it's going to be hard to see. But you know, the cloud forest is the only place many exotic creatures can live. Well, if they're not edible, I'm not interested. Snake. To navigate a cloud forest? From all around the world to witness... Do you need a cloud atlas? Get it? Like the movie that nobody watched? <laughs> Nick, watch out for the frogs. Why? They bite? Relax. No frogs ever eat. Cloud Atlas? <laughs> Although, 
I feasted on a few frogs' legs myself. But they are dangerous. They are poisonous. Poisonous? Within dark frogs live up to their name, I assure you. Their poison is so strong. The Indigena use them to make poison-tipped arrows. Some secrete poison through their skin. <laughs> Even touching them can be dangerous. So don't go petting them or anything. Uh, so... I can't eat one. I am warning you. Really? Y'all? Okay. <laughs> it was a uh, Wachowski sister's movie. I think while they were still making movies together, that nowadays is known for um, some racist stuff. <laughs> One of the actors was, uh, was uh, in some makeup. But I remember liking the movie as a, as a young person. Catarata de la Muerte means waterfall of death. Huh. How cheerful. I am sure it will be no problem for you, Snake. Especially compared to all the dire situations you've faced in the past. Yeah, easy to say now. We'll see what really happens. Sorry. Still, you have surprised me. Everything they say about the legend is true. I'm neither hero nor legend. But for some reason, I don't mind you calling me that. Thanks. Be careful, Snake. Peace. I'm not a huge movie person either. That's just one that I watch. There was a time where I lived somewhere that didn't have internet, really. So, pretty much all we had for entertainment was like going to the library and getting movies. Both. <laughs> both checking them out of the library and using the library's internet, so. The one that I went to actually had like a huge like indie movie selection, like super super indie. They had like a subscription to, um, I forget what the company is called, but it was like like student films and stuff like that they would get they would get dvds like i think monthly of just a bunch of self-published student film type things so they had a ton of interesting stuff selva de la muerte huh forest of death i miss that live day want to get lost here you sure wouldn't but do not worry I will be your guide. Happy to hear it. By the way, Snake, you know much about sloths? Just the name. They are amazing. Sloths spend almost all of their lives up in the trees. Except for when they have to Hey, can I say that, like, Texas libraries fucking suck? Eat a thing. <laughs> They're not the most I've been to. Why do you think they are called sloths? They hardly move. So they hardly but you don't need, like, energy. so many aisles for, like, cowboy books. Low body temperature, lowering their metabolism further and allowing them to survive on very little. Wouldn't that make it easier for them to get picked off by predators? They stick to the trees, helping them blend in and stay out of sight. They say there are even some sloths that grow moss when they reach a certain age, like some sort of fairy tale forest hermit, huh? I knew a great old sniper once. Guess he was even more in tune with nature than I thought. Old sniper? What are you talking about? La Ruinas de Xochiquetza will be around there. They have not been restored at all, so they may well be covered in plants. Xochiquetza? An Aztec goddess of fertility and beauty. They say she was always accompanied by birds and butterflies. One theory states she was the mother of the god known as Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl. The Quetzal is said to be an incarnation of Quetzalcoatl. Wait, Snake can't say Pemetaxonomist, but he can say Quetzalcoatl. Quetzal this place definitely matches the atmosphere. Qu Quetzalcoatl. Well, it may have seen better days, but that is still a temple, so be sure to show respect when you're inside. If the mood strikes me. <sighs> well, you've got no one to blame but yourself. If Shochi Quetzal strikes you down. I 
do not know if I recall such large ruins being there. Uh, didn't you say there's a lot we don't know about Costa Rica's ancient civilizations? You talked about some giant stone balls, too. What are those? <laughs> don't say it like that, Snake. <laughs> Costa Rica? They are an assortment of giant spheres carved from stone that were discovered in the jungles of Costa Rica about 50 years ago. And what's so special about that? What if I told you? Some of them are nearly perfect spheres. And that they were carved out of granite, which is quite a hard substance. Hmm. Could be good to make a trap. If they're spherical, they roll beastly too. Snake! Hold on, I'm, I'm looking up images of these. Apparently there's a shit ton. Okay. Wow. If it's that, hmm. Hold on, I actually go. I want to look. I want to look into this for a second. Have they like dated these? The stone fields of Costa Rica are an assortment of over three hundred petrospheres. Locally, they are known as the Bolesta Piedra. Literally stone balls. Commonly attributed to the extinct Daki culture. They're thought to have been placed in lines along the approach to the House of Chiefs. Chiefs. But the exact significance remains uncertain. Archaeological findings date back to the Aguas Buenas period, 300 to 800 CE. And Chiri Chiriki period, uh, 800 to 1550 CE. So, pretty old. <laughs> Fields could represent solar systems or just be inspired by various stages of the sun. Interesting. Oh god, some are even bigger, it looks like. Okay, one, one more picture, and then we'll get back to it. That's real big. It's real to think about that one that I just closed. Um, if only the top of it was sticking out, it wouldn't have been much longer before they were like completely lost, <laughs> like completely covered with um, with dirt. So tell me, what do they mine around here? Gold, if I am not mistaken. Gold? No kidding. I wonder what would be the fastest way to... I do not know how much success they have had. You do not hear of anyone still operating mines around here. Uh oh. Generally speaking, people here are not too thrilled with outside capital coming in and taking away the country's natural resources. Four years ago, 
A group of protesters hurled stones at the parliament building. Nice. People found out the country had been bestowing mining rights to foreign companies. Nice, nice, nice. They must have had to clear a considerable amount of forest to open up that mine. No doubt. So much for any hiding places, too. And it is not just the forest. Without the proper precautions, the mine's wastewater could pollute the groundwater. And to top it all off, they're developing nuclear weapons there, too. How can people care so little about their own country? I'm not the one to ask about that. Well, you may have abandoned your country, but you still treasure where you came from. Hmm. You think so? Sure. I know you do. Paz, you... I... <sighs> Whatever you do, never stop loving your country. I want to know more about Big Boss's past. We've been getting little bits and pieces of, like, his time in the military before Operation Snake Eel, or Vulture's mission. But every once in a while I'm like, okay, I want to know... I want to know more. Bring back... <laughs> bring back Python from, uh, Portable Ops. Give him a whole whole series of uh, tapes. Since it was founded, my country has not once been able to choose its own path. First Spain, then America. Over 100 years of this. I know. In the 19th century, an American mercenary named William Walker seized power in Nicaragua. I'd heard he exploited rivalries between the political parties. Even after we expelled him, the Americans sent in their marines under the pretext of quelling political unrest. And the real reason? To intimidate the government and thwart the construction of the Nicaragua Canal. I thought the U.S. already has the rights to build a canal in Nicaragua. They never intended to build a canal there. They'd already started digging in Panama. A canal in Nicaragua would break up the Panama Canal's monopoly. Reason enough for America to stick its nose into our affairs. They snagged the rights so nobody else mm. could build there. It was General Sandino. Makes sense. To the Los Yankees. General Sandino waged a guerrilla war against the Marines, at last driving them out. He was a true hero, and to us Sandinistas, like a father. But when they pulled out, the Americans left us something to remember them by. The National Guard. Yes, La Guardia. In name, a peacekeeping force. But in reality, Commander Somoza's personal army, answering to no one else. Unable to stay silent, General Sandino went to protest and was assassinated by Somoza as he made his way home. It was then that Somoza and Los Sapos began to eat our country alive from the inside. William Walker was a real guy, just a random U.S. citizen who took over Nicaragua. Was he actually a random guy, or was he, you know, you know, you know? <laughs> It has been 40 years since the Somoza family became the rulers of Nicaragua. With La Guardia at their command, no one can challenge them. You came here on the run from the National Guard, right? See, si. They took everything. Our land, our homes, our jobs. Now belong to Somoza. See, si. The law, too. He's even got the judges in his pocket. You defy him, you face death. Everyone bows and scrapes before La Guardia. Even then, you might get a beating if they are in a bad mood. And you're trying to change things. That's not all. These Samosas have used their power to line their pockets. They confiscate people's land and hand it to members of the Samosa family. By now, close to half the farmland in Nicaragua is theirs. We were powerless. Until... You remember the earthquake two years ago? Yeah. I heard the capital was hit pretty hard. We lost Managua, our capital city. People sent aid from all around the world. Tears of sorrow turned to tears of joy. 
Yet almost all of it was embezzled by the Samosas. God. They sold out those who'd lost everything for money. They feasted on our country's suffering. Public resentment is at the boiling point. The Samosas' days are numbered. We will see to it. Good. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I thought he was an intelligence guy since he was pre-CIA and he was arrested by the authorities multiple times for invading foreign countries. I forget what the name of was it uh, the agency before the CIA. There was something, but I forget the actual specific name. I don't know, I wouldn't put it past the US intelligence to make a guy do something, then arrest him when people find out. That kind of shit happens all the time, honestly. Originally, no more than the commander of La Guardia. Ordinarily, a man of his station could never hope to become president. But the president at the time had no power to back him. The only one with the strength to oppose him was General Sandino. No, better to say the general was the only one who dared oppose him. There was nothing special about him. Above all, it takes a strong will to see justice done. That is what he taught us. Mm -hmm. It's also what motivated Somoza to have him killed. But... Yeah. Back then, I mean, like Shay also was doing shit like that, kind of. And once he had the power, just going around raising armies. So that's something that you could actually pull off back then. That's why they didn't want to hand over power to a rebellious general. Even so, it's hard to believe Washington would give its blessing to a guy like that. The American president at the time put it this way: "Somoza may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch." In other words. Better a dog or los sapos than an anti-U.S. regime. The Managua earthquake struck two years ago, the day before Christmas Eve. Giant cracks opened up in the street. Sleeping children were crushed in collapsing houses. No chance to escape. No visit from Santa Claus. Thanks to Samosa, the old houses could not even get rebuilt. It was a nightmare. I heard the epicenter was right in the middle of the city. Even today, it's too dangerous to build on top of the fault line. The city center is still in ruins. And to make things worse, Samosa stole the recovery money. We must not fail. We owe it to those who lost their lives. We will defeat Samosa. I don't get that. Well, I mean, I kind of do, but like... What's the point of running a country if you're letting the country fucking fall? I know money, but <laughs> still. The river that flows between Nicaragua and Costa Rica is the Rio San Juan. It connects Lago Cosibolca to El Mar Caribe. It is a gentle river. Safe, even for small boats. You have to watch out for the sharks, though. Sharks? In a river? El Tibron Toro live in the river. But there's nothing to fear. San Juan will protect you always. Wuhan? The Rio San Juan takes its name from San Juan. The man who baptized Jesus? The man you call John the Baptist in your country. Hmm. John, huh? I'll be careful anyway. I'd hate to drown. End of a John Doe. Waka waka. There is a volcanic island in Lago Cosibolca called Ometepe. It's formed from two connected volcanoes shaped like a porongo. The one with smoke coming out of it. That's the one. The smoking volcano is Concepcion. It erupts once in a while. The other one is Maderas. It's never erupted in recorded history. There's a lake in the caldera at the top. A crater lake. Mm. Let's hope there's not another underground factory inside. Don't say that. If Peace Walker's nukes detonated there, it would destabilize the magma underneath. It could cause the volcano to erupt again. If that happens, my country is doomed. Snake, you must stop Peace Walker. If the volcanoes are like side by side, practically, wouldn't they likely be... Technically the same volcanic system. Which would explain why one erupts and the other doesn't. We 
we are Sandinistas, the heirs of General Sandino's will. Mm -hmm. Sandino, the father of modern guerrilla warfare. To you, me. To us, he's more like a real father. That why you named yourselves after him? Of course. La Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional. The Sandinista National Liberation Front is named in his honor. We share the General's goal to take back our country's freedom in his day from America, in ours from the despot Samosa. Mm. Times have changed, but the song remains the same. Patria libre o morir, that is our story. El Che used to say the same thing, you know. Patria o muerte, the slogan of the Cuban Revolution. So, you're fighting for a socialist revolution too, then? No. Nice. It's not about ideology. We only want to live normal lives. We are sick of living in a country where you can be beaten for walking down the street. Where you never know if your neighbor is snitching on you. Our goal is to give back the country to its people. Yeah. The Cuban Revolution started out like that, too. We are few in number, but we will win. Victoria o muerte. For a revolutionary, there is no other fate. Augusto Cesar Sandino, general and hero of Nicaragua. Fifty years ago, conflict broke out between the political parties of Nicaragua. The U.S. Marines intervened in the name of restoring order. The only one who refused to listen to their call for reconciliation was General Sandino. Huh. One man against the Marines. That takes guts. The general wasn't a professional soldier. Neither were his compadres, and they certainly could not match the Marines' equipment. But he used the land to his advantage, lurking in the fields and hills of Nicaragua, and using surprise attacks to harass the Marines. I know. I've read plenty of textbooks on guerrilla warfare. In the end, he drove them out. He was truly a role model for us. Yeah, but that was the 30s. Didn't the Depression have something to do with it? It takes cash to wage war. Perhaps. But there is no denying what the general accomplished. The people hailed him as the general de hombres libres. The general of free men. They loved him. And then, he was assassinated by Anastasio Somoza Garcia, commander of La Guardia. The father of the current Somoza. Somoza had the Americans backing. That is the way things were. The general may be dead, and the times may have changed. But it's still lives on inside. It's still surprising to me. I guess it's not too surprising coming from Kojima. But just being so explicit about <laughs> about America's shenanigans to put it in, in that's a that's a weird way to say it, but you know what I mean. How's the watermelon business these days? Just being so blatantly saying, like, fuck the CIA, fuck, <laughs> fuck American interference. You know our nickname. I'm impressed. No wonder they call you boss. <laughs> you used to hide your weapons in hollowed out watermelons, smuggle them right past the National Guard. You even transported pineapple grenades that way. The name caught on among sympathizers in the region and... What are you talking about? <laughs> They call us watermelon sellers because the general's name sounds like the word for watermelon, sandia. Really? Si. Damn it, cuz. <laughs> A revolution to bring peace to your country, huh? No matter how much we fight, peace never gets any closer, does it? Is Carlos just like constantly gaslighting Snake? If we do not fight back, they'll just keep exploiting us. You want proof? Look at our country's history. Revolution is a means, and not an end. I know. When the revolution is victorious, I want my country to be at peace. But to bring peace, we have to first eliminate that traitorous scum. Uh, it's an old saying. We make war that we may live in peace. Who said it? Aristotle. You know your history. I had a good teacher. It has always been like this. People making the same mistakes over and over. And still, all we can do is fight. I hear you. If you've got a goal, 
You've got to keep moving forward. I noticed you called Che Guevara El Che. Not just us. Everyone in these parts does. Che was always his nickname. It does not feel right to call him by his last name. I was shocked the first time I saw you. You look so much like him. Huh. I look like El Che, huh? Sort of. Not in the face. It's more the way you I mean, even in the face, he looks a lot like him. <laughs> of course. The FSLN was formed in the spirit of the ideologies championed by El Che and Fidel. Hmm. Fidel. Fidel Castro. So, you were trying to bring the Cuban Revolution to Nicaragua. Well, we were. But Cuba didn't, didn't she just say that she wasn't a second ago? El Che left. El Che was a true revolutionary. He fought and died for the people. He worked harder than anybody, and he was a righteous man. Even as a minister of Cuba, he gave up his weekends to work on the farms and public works. As a volunteer, no less. Yeah, I've heard the stories. But when you think about it, wasn't it that obsession that did him in? How do you mean? We can't all be supermen. He thought the ideals he applied in Cuba would work in Bolivia. But he failed to win converts and the support of the peasants. And it cost him his life. Maybe. Maybe you are right. But at least he did not steal from those peasants, no matter how hard things got. Yeah, I can sympathize with that. There's plenty of guerrillas out there who would rob their own people to feed their revolutions. If we had a comandante like him, the Sandinistas would find the will to fight. You know, say what you will about, like, the politics of everything. Like, whether you agree with his goals or not, it would be nice if there were more people. <laughs> more people who were willing to give so much of themselves that way. Again, assuming you even believe. Believe the stories about him. Because, like, I'm not going to sit here and say he was a saint, but, you know. You called that giant. Would be nice if people right weren't all horrible. It means new man. New man. Like 100% shitty people. It must be controlled by machine. Yeah, it seems that way. No human being could pull off those crazy maneuvers. But it's not crazy. It's smart. It sings, too. When we first saw it, one of your men said, Pilot must be an Hombre Nuevo. Me? I do not like the name. Why? Hombre Nuevo was what El Che was striving to become. What all of us who joined the Sandinistas strive to become. That's why. An Hombre Nuevo is one who finds joy in virtue and voluntary labor. It makes me furious to see that name given to such a monster. How bad. Chico called that helicopter El Calibri. Our name for the hummingbird. You saw how that chopper moved? How it hovered in midair like a hummingbird? Uh, a hell of a lot bigger than a bird, though. True, but better than Hombre Nuevo, don't you think? When you get kidnapped by El Calibri, it's all over. They take you to a prison camp and torture you until you snitch on your compas. That's what took Chico. They have no mercy. Once you talk, they toss you out like trash. I knew this, and still I could not save Chico. If he cannot be saved, I will do what must be done. Don't write him off like that. Sometimes you have to survive, even if it means sacrificing your honor. I'll get him back. Oh, this was a long time ago. <laughs> We've had Chico back for a long time. Snake, I need your opinion. How strong are the enemy's mercenaries? They're well trained. They've got more than enough men. Seasoned, too. A lot of them probably saw action in Vietnam. They're a tough bunch, and armed to the teeth. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a mercenary force field that many tanks and attack choppers. It shows how much cash they have to throw around, and connections. How did they get access to such weapons? How do you think? They're backed by the one and only CIA. CIA! Half of us farmers, and the other half students. Children, even. Weapons. We're so short on guns, we have to steal them from the enemy. I hate to say it, 
We're always going to be on the defensive. I know. And mi viejo. Without him, we... Yeah, I know. I don't know if we can win. Can we, Snake? Stop feeling sorry for yourself. But... Amanda. What? Listen to me. Don't ever let your men hear you talk like that. And what Big Boss thought of Super Commandante Mocos when the Zapatistas rose up? No, uh... Fear and uncertainty could good, you. good question? Your comrades look to for reassurance. That's what a leader is. Don't forget it. Snake. If you're looking for comfort, go find a church. That's all I've got to say. You are right. I am sorry. I need to pull myself together. You'll be fine. That could be a real thing or completely made up. I can't tell, honestly. <laughs> the land in our country belongs to us, and yet it does not belong to us. How so? Along the coast, it is all banana groves. And in the mountains, it is coffee. I guess in that way, it is not so different from here. I think once we finish with um, all the Amanda's tapes, I'm going to take a quick break. Money for themselves, leaving precious little to the farmers. Worse. My eyes are starting to sweat, so I need to cool off. But it does bring in foreign currency. He says were well, anarcho-communists who revolted against Mexico in the 90s. I recommend the looking into it. The name sounds familiar, but yeah, I'm bad at history. <laughs> Exported to America from private ports. It's like having little American enclaves along the coast of Nicaragua. But the farmers have no choice but to go work there. Es ridículo. The people have to take their land. Sounds like something. It is one of the I could get behind people. theoretically. <laughs> so. I'll try to remember to look, in, look that up. When exactly did you realize your dad was working with the KGB? About six months ago. Up until then, we only had beans to eat. And then suddenly, we started to get eggs and flour. Our bullet shortage simply disappeared. How'd he get the cocaine? Ask the KGB. All we did here was process it. <clears throat> Coca plants grow here, too. But to my knowledge, almost all of the stuff we used came from Colombia and Bolivia. It's processed in a factory and then shipped to ports on the Caribbean Sea. Where does it go after that? I never thought about it. I mean, I did not want to think about it. Uh, the biggest cocaine consumer in the world is the United States. I'm guessing they smuggle it in on vessels disguised as fishing boats. Wait. La CIA uses that route too. Are you telling me they're selling cocaine to their own country? Yeah. <laughs> that way. Those bastards are turning their own children into junkies? Are they insane? No. Just afraid. Afraid of a communist central You America. can't fund the war on drugs if you don't have drugs in your country, so... La Cia calls their new toy Peace Walker, eh? Yeah. So? It is an insult to us Nikos. Because of the guy you were talking about. Walker. See. Si. That's a whole... That's a whole level can of forms, so... Political parties in Nicaragua were at each other's throats. The Nicaraguan Democratic Party hired an American mercenary to help counter their enemies, the Conservative Party. And that was Walker. After taking care of the Conservatives, Walker decided to seize power in Nicaragua for himself, eventually making himself president. Huh. The Democratic Party gave him an inch, and he took the whole country. But it did not end there. Not only did he make English an official language, he tried to reintroduce... Jeez. The Walker's goal was to build a Caribbean empire. Centered on the American South. Caribbean Empire? Huh. Sounds kind of like what Coldman is trying to pull off. The gringos are always like that. They invent some convenient excuse to trample all over foreign countries like they own the place. Peace Walker. Ha. What happened to Walker in the end? A United Central American Army led by Costa Rica kicked his ass and sent him running back to America. Hell yeah. Why don't we do the same? I, for one, don't intend to let Coldman get his way. Good idea. I'm glad we have you, boss. Amanda, when did you join up with the Sandinistas? About a year ago, when I went into the mountains with mi viejo and his group. I thought your dad was with the FSLN from the start. 
No. Have you ever looked at somebody's face for so long that you start to like overanalyze it? Tired for a while. He found a job, got a wife and a house, and raised us kids. Then one day, some Sandinista students came by. Maybe that's just like the oldest in me, but I'm looking at. I'm just focusing on different features of her face at this point. But then LaGuardia showed up. They broke into our house and began pushing him around, shouting questions. I'm guessing he kept his mouth shut. No matter how hard they hit him. Our house was trashed. After that, he was on their list. They harassed him day and night. It was only then that he gave himself over to the Sandinistas. He kept it hidden from us at first, so we would not get hurt. <sighs> he sounds like a good father. He was. But my mother got fed up with it. She left us. I don't blame her. Why didn't you go with her? It was a hard decision for sure. But like my father, I could not let Samosa get away with his crimes. But most of all... Chico. He is too much like his papa. One way or the other, he was going to stay. And I could not leave him behind. Soon enough, La Guardia drove us out. And we found ourselves in the mountains. It just kind of happened. Wow. For an accidental revolutionary, you sure put up a hell of a fight. The mountains make men into warriors. The training is harsh. But it brings us that much closer to being hombres nuevos. Chico couldn't ask for a better sister. I can see why they picked you to be Commandante. When I was little, I came down with malaria. Unlucky for me, it was the bad kind. I was in a daze the whole time. And at one point they said I was not going to make it. Mm. Malarial encephalopathy. I hear it's pretty common in tropical malaria cases. Even today... Snake, I think you've technically had that. <laughs> Since then, I've had this fear of mosquitoes. When I hear them buzzing nearby, I get jumpy. Ah, uh, that explains the chain smoking. See, I thought it might help keep the mosquitoes away, just a little. Maybe it is all in my head. You're the same way, right? Oh, uh, I will say this. I prefer a cigar over mosquitoes. <laughs> I'm glad that they all talking about it, because <laughs> I mentioned this a little. Take guts to conquer your fear like that, and live a gorilla's life in the wild. It is nothing. El Che did not let asthma stop him from leading the revolution. Really? Hmm. Compared to him, I am no hero. Can you... Do they let you join the military if you have asthma? Like in the U.S. military, I mean. I guess nowadays they probably do like just not a, not like a frontline guy, maybe? That seems like it would be pretty bad to have. I'm sorry to hear about your dad. Thank you for saying that. Mi viejo was the leader of the Frente. He was the last of the generation that knew General Sandino. He saw the general's exploits firsthand as a boy. He would tell us stories about it all the time and about how the general was assassinated. Did you know he was getting money from the KGB? I had some idea, but I did not have the courage to confront him about it. I know it was a painful decision for him to make. Uh, I can imagine. Yes, my father was a good man. I loved him as a daughter, and his soldiers believed in him. Thanks to him, La Frente held together even in the worst of times. I don't know if I can ever fill his shoes. Chico's 12, right? <laughs> right. Isn't he Damn, I thought he was like... Short. Per at least like 15. Malnourishment. 15, 16. It's hard to come by when you're running around in the jungle. <laughs> He's got quite an appetite. I know. I didn't want him to come in the first place. But there was no one to take him in. I had no choice but to look after him. Don't be so hard on yourself. Sometimes it's better for a kid to be with his family than far away in a safe place. Hmm. Thank you. Promise me this, though. When your fight is over, make sure he gets a proper education. Give him a chance to be something other than a gorilla. It's not too late to teach mm. him something other than fighting. Okay, mm. I promise. You know what book Chico really likes? 
the World Encyclopedia of Mysterious Creatures. The Loch Ness Monster, the Yeti... You amaze. Yeah, I know. He's still so much like a boy. I worry about him. He'll be fine. I know plenty of grown men who still go crazy over UMAs. Are... are you serious? I'm sure Chica will have a perfectly fine future. I want to return the favor. Just wait until you're healed up. Yeah. Then we'll talk. I appreciate that, but you need all the help you can get. It might take a while for me to heal completely, but I'll be fine once I'm on my feet. Put me in a combat unit. I'll pull my weight. I wouldn't expect any less from a Sandinista Commandante. <sighs> Enough flattery. But seriously, it does not feel right for me to be sitting here while my compas are out risking their lives. One thing's for sure. Having you out in the field would be a big boost to Sandinista morale. Of course our ultimate goal is still the overthrow of Samosa. But until we get ourselves back in order, we will follow your lead, wherever it takes us. Glad to have you on board. Amanda, you getting used to Mother Base? Yes, it is heaven compared to living in the mountains. We are no longer constantly on the run from La Guardia or mercenaries. Some of the new guys we recruited used to be mercenaries. We are getting along. It was difficult at first, but once you talk to them, you realize we've got plenty in common. I see. Good to hear. We may be enemies, but we are all still human beings. La Cia's soldiers, La Guardia. The same goes for the people of America. I feel like you. these games never really in order to scrape tackle the issue that a lot of soldiers are fucking stupid. the KGB said, all for Nicaragua, or so he told himself. But I realize now, in the end, all he did was help poison young people of America. Yeah. I have made up my mind. Even when I leave Mother Base and return to La Revolución, I will never turn to drugs. Nor will I look to the KGB for help. If we topple Somoza using the KGB and drug money, we will lose the people's hearts. So, you're choosing a different path from your father. I still respect him, but I will not do things the way he did. Well, I'm sure Chico will be glad to hear that. Chico is a grown soldier now. I could not face him otherwise. Well said, Amanda. Those are the words of a true Comandante. Stop. I was inspired by the greatest Comandante I have ever known. Boss. Ah. <laughs> Amanda's cool. <laughs> I like Amanda a lot. Okay, I'm going to take... a break. Cool off and get some water and stuff. We still have a bunch of tapes to go. <laughs> I promise we will get to the actual gameplay tonight, but... But I want to listen to all this stuff. So... I will be... right back.
So I have a question. How loud is my air conditioner right now? I can tell it's picking up on the mic, but I'm kind of considering leaving it on. You can heal it, but let me tell my family. Oh, you can't, you can or you can't heal it? I have noise suppression on. <laughs> I have, um... I have a noise gate, compressor, limiter, and equalizer on. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, hold on, let me try something. This might make it better or it might make it worse.
Well, it might crash everything. Let's see. If I go in here... Okay, I'm about to turn on a setting. The setting is now turned on. Is that better or worse? The setting is on. The setting is on. The setting is off. The setting is off. Walsh? Okay, I kind of had a feeling it would be, so... <laughs> that was just a different, different equalizer settings. AC is not a deal bigger. Okay, I'll leave it on while we do the tapes. And then maybe I can turn it back off when we, uh... Get into gameplay. My audio is already kind of shitty, so I think AC is probably not that bad. I didn't finish my thought <laughs> before I left. I was too busy thinking about how I need to cool off. Um, I was going to talk about how Kojima does this whole thing about how, oh, well, at the end of the day, we're all humans and we can all, should all be able to get along if we, like, talk <laughs> and recognize that we're all human. But I feel like at the same time, he doesn't really humanize the soldiers at all. He just says the human and doesn't really think about how they still have like their own motivations and especially considering the soldiers that we're dealing with in this are like full-on CIA, they would probably be pretty, you know, indoctrinated into into their own belief system. And then on the other hand, just regular grunt soldiers or like, uh, like people out of high school and shit. I could believe some of them might, you know, change, but they would also be pretty dumb, so... Don't even drink these ones. Pretty, pretty much, honestly. <laughs> I honestly keep forgetting that this game somehow got away with letting you just fucking kill so many people in the CIA. my mic down. Either way, I won't know until I get there. If that'll make it less loud. <laughs> I 
And then if I talk, does that go back up to... I don't know. I don't know. It's probably fine. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's a river in the mountains north of the village. You'll see a water pipe running across that's got a walkway you can use as a bridge. I guess they built it to carry water from the hydroelectric plant. To get there, though, you gotta get past the barricade north of the prison. Got it. El Basilisco supposedly lives in the gorge up there, so be careful you don't get distracted and fall in the river. The Basilisco? Not the big monster I saw. I mean, the real Basilisco. <laughs> a real one? The legendary king of snakes? More like a lizard, I guess. It walks on top of the river. A uh, lizard that walks on water? Man, you should see it. It's not that big, though. Only about one bite along. Pretty good size for a lizard. Yeah, but not nearly as big as a dinosaur. Now that I think about it, I don't know how recruitment works for, like, the, the JSDF. Um, I wonder if Kojima even has, like, a, a real sense of how Omi recruitment is in the U.S. Like, I'm sure he knows about it, but I wonder if he has, like, an actual, like, grasp of how, <laughs> how fucked up it can be. Because I feel like if he did, he would think even less of <laughs> the random soldier. <laughs> But in any, in any case, we're talking about cryptids now, so... So there's a real basilisco that lives in the river? I'm only saying I heard stories from people who said they saw it. But I know lots of places to find it in Nicaragua. Do you want to go have a look? I don't have time for sightseeing. Uh, you don't like lizards? It's not that. I just think snakes taste better. Who said anything about taste? How about you? You like them? Not that way. They do look kind of like dinosaurs, though. You don't think that's cool? No, they're both reptiles, yeah. But there's a big difference size-wise. I'll bet there are still big ones around somewhere. They say mammals multiplied and ate up their eggs. But they can't all be gone. They've got to exist somewhere out there. Hmm. Dinosaur eggs, huh? And animals are always evolving, right? Maybe they evolved so much... They don't even look like dinosaurs anymore. Then you can't really call them dinosaurs, can you? I guess not. Yeah, you're right. Dinosaurs have got to be big. I don't know how Chico would feel about dinosaurs having feathers. He seems like he'd appreciate it. He'd probably think, oh yeah, that makes it cooler. weird animals for me? People all over the world tell stories about giant monsters living in lakes. Nessie in Loch Ness, Nahuelito in Argentina, Ogopogo in Canada. I can hardly keep track of them all. They say that all these sightings prove dinosaurs do still exist. But crater lakes are isolated. They're not connected to rivers. Yeah, but you know Mokele Mumbembe in the Congo River? He can walk on land. So maybe they moved there from some other lake. Huh. You sure know a lot about UMAs. There used to be a guy in El Frente who was a hunter. He taught me lots of things. He even said he once went to a place called Isla del Monstruo. A hunter on Isla del What do you think Chico's fulsona is? I'm going to be a hunter and catch some rare animals. Right after we restore peace to our land, of course. But he's definitely a scaly, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Did you ever hear of the Loch Ness Monster? Now that one I know. Pretty much everyone's heard of old Nessie. Great, so I don't have to explain. I think she's a long lost dinosaur, don't you? Um, sure, why not? One of the compas gave me a book about it, with photos. It looks exactly like the Plesiosaur. Then why does it only look- If Chico was like around nowadays, 
back when Loch Ness... He'd definitely be into, like, photo gin. ...became trapped there when the climate changed. There weren't any mammals there, so no natural predators. Today... Or something, something like that. Some... Some clothed species. ...monsters in the other lakes with similar climates. Exactly. That's why there's been giant monster sightings in a bunch of other places. Like Nahuelito and Ogopogo. I don't know if there's one in Irasu, too. But I know there's definitely something living in Lago Cosipolca. By the way, if you notice me, like, ducking, it's because I'm also eating while these tapes are playing, so... So I apologize for that. You mentioned the Nahuelito. What is it? It's a plesiosaur that lives in Lago Nahuel Huapi in Argentina. It's described a little differently, but I'm sure it's basically the same creature as Nessie. Except for one thing. What? Well, according to one theory, it's the result of a nuclear test back in the 50s. What? There's no record of a nuclear test in Argentina in the 50s. At the time, the president, General Juan Perón, was pushing hard to industrialize the country. I wouldn't be surprised if he conducted a top-secret nuclear test before he was overthrown in a coup. Mm, sounds a little far-fetched to me. You think? Then maybe Nahuelito really is a dinosaur. No, I didn't say that... I mean, it's really pretty obvious. Wait a minute. Thanks for clearing that up, boss. I was going to say he could just be a kaiju kid, which he obviously is, but you know what I mean. But I think, I think that conversation specifically makes it lean further away from just being a kaiju fan. Do you go to also ask the Libyan ancient aliens? Oh yeah. Even Paz was kind of getting into like, oh, the spheres might be ancient technology just a little bit. What about the Ogo Pogo? What kind of name is that, anyway? Ogopogo is a monster that lives in Okanagan Lake, in Canada. I guess it's an Indian name, because it's a legend passed down by the Indians. Uh, a legend, huh? Well, then it's probably not... There's written records of it, too! The first one was in 1872, and there's been more sightings since the start of the 20th century. Uh-huh. You, started you know what he is? Two snake? Yeah. Chico would be way into Slender Man. Now that's a real man's adventure. What do you think? Chico would absolutely be like a creepy pasta kid as well. You want to go exploring together? Well, we'll see. Might not be such a bad life. Mokele Mumbembe lives in the Congo River. There's nothing mysterious about it, though. It's already been confirmed as a real living dinosaur. The local people know all about it. And when they were shown a drawing of a brontosaurus, every one of them said it was Mokele Mumbembe. Hmm. When peace returns to Nicaragua, I want to go to the Congo myself. Oh, the revolutionary movement in the Congo ended in failure, you know. Yeah, I know. I wish we could do something to help, but Africa's awfully far away. Africa. I wonder if El Che ever saw Mokele Mumbembe. I wonder if I will. Well, best to take care of business here before daydreaming about Africa. Yeah, I guess you're right. I showed it off while we were playing uh, Potable Ops, but I kind of wish they did get a chance to use Chico's, like, adult Chico in, like, the fall future where he's, like, a weird, weird, like, demon man. <laughs> he looks like a Devil May Cry knockoff or something. I don't play a game where Chico fucking fights monsters. Let me see if I can pull that up since we're, since we're here.
it's so so different <laughs> to what we know of Chico but but it's kind of awesome and now that I know that he wanted to be a monster hunter it kind of makes sense that he would he would do something like this I just want to know, maybe they talk about it in, in one of like behind the scenes books, but I really want to know how he would end up like this. Cause like I know some of the stuff that happens, well, I know, I know what happens to, to Chico and how he ends up, but, but like what causes this? <laughs> Anyway. Chico, you know much about Cloud for us? Mm, not that much. All I know is Punish Chico. Honestly, Chico. Chico deserves that title more than Snake does, so. But, like, for instance, you gotta watch out for poison dark frogs. Both Rain and Cloud Force have high humidity. So they're perfect environments for frogs and other amphibians. I mean, it's not like just touching a strawberry poison dart frog or a dying dart frog is going to kill you. But don't eat them, no matter how hungry you get. I can get all the rations I need from Mother Base. No jungle food for me this time. Seriously? You're not disappointed you don't get to eat wild animals? <laughs> what do you think I am? <laughs> just kidding. In Colombia, though, there's a frog. The golden dart frog that's lethal to the touch. How do you know all this? Come on. Don't you think poisonous animals are cool? Not if you get poisoned by one. Well, obviously. One more thing. When you get to the forest, be on the lookout for Bigfoot. I... I... think I'll be okay there. Sorry, I was finishing my food. Oh, hell yeah, we get a whole section about Bigfoot. <laughs> Bigfoot is an ape man that lives in the Rocky Mountains. In the local I'm an ape man, I'm an ape man, I'm an ape man. He's over three vitamins. Can you believe that? So he's kind of like a gorilla. Completely different. Even the biggest gorillas only get to about two vitamins, and they walk on their knuckles. Bigfoot's big. And he walks on two feet, like people. So, he's more man than ape. Probably. His ancestors must have split off from humans at some point. Like, before they started using tools and stuff. Yeah, but... The Rockies kind of far away from here. Yeah, not that far. According to Darwin, humans came all the way over here from Africa. Plus, there have been sightings in Venezuela of an ape man called Mono Grande. Costa Rica has tons of plant and animal species. So I'd expect there to be at least one kind of ape man. Why do people always forget that Bigfoot was female? I know it's kind of difficult to tell in like the old versions of the tape, but Bigfoot had like boobs. People, people know that, right? <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Not the fucking monster truck. Also, when you realize 
that Bigfoot had boobs. It makes it much more obvious it's a costume, because <laughs> it looked very unrealistic. Not a fucking web pee. Hold on. Hold on. Webpea is possibly the most thing to happen to the internet <laughs> in a while. So look, 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 look. Right there. Those are boobs. But they're also like in the middle of the abdomen. <laughs> so they look like absolute shit. But the original, the original costume was definitely supposed to be female. They're so low down, it looks so bad. this fucking image off the screen now. <laughs> Is much you know more ferocious. I think your maze should be dangerous. Otherwise, <clears throat> where's the fun in hunting them? Did you see a quetzal snake? Yep. What do you think? Did it look like a snake? Huh? No, it, it didn't look like a snake. Oh, really? It must be different from the quetzalcoatl then. Quetzalcoatl. A winged snake from the Mayan and Aztec legend. A winged snake. <laughs> Weird, right? I bet it's UMA. Amanda, everybody says... <laughs> yeah, okay, we're getting into, like, ancient alien stuff guy. now. But there's no way anybody mistake a snake for a bird. I think the legend of Quetzalcoatl came first. Somebody saw it and adopted it as their god before they saw the Quetzal. After that, somebody saw a bird that looked like the image of the god, and so they named it Quetzal. You mean it happened the other way around? Well, if you ask me, the Quetzalcoatl was probably a pterosaur that survived. I mean... It's got wings and, and it's a reptile, so it probably looks kind of like a snake, right? Pterosaurs live on in Africa even today. They're called the Congamato and the Elitziao. So it makes sense that there'd be pterosaurs on the American continent too, and that they survived until the Mayan and Aztec era. Wow. Well, lucky for us, they're not still around today. It's a, they aren't. It's probably a good thing Chico doesn't have access to the internet, years. honestly. The Aztec civilization only rose about 600 years ago. If they managed to survive 65 million years, surely they couldn't be wiped out in 600. <clears throat> Pterosaurs survive today in the African countries of Cameroon and Congo. Each tribe calls them by a different name, like Congomato or Litsiao. There sure are a lot of dinosaurs. I can't blame them. The when I was young, I really well, liked cryptid a lot of the land stuff. Been settled by humans. They've survived all this time just undiscovered by man. But they're finding fossils in America, too. This one they found three years ago in Texas had a wingspan of more than 12 meters. Oh, the Thunderbolt? If I saw a gigantic pterosaur like that, <laughs> I'd probably call it a god, too. Yup, I'm sure that's what the Quetzalcoatl really is. 
I think this Thunderbolt was in Texas, wasn't it? A base disguised as a mine? Huh. We never made it that far. I don't know what kind of place it is, but you better be careful, just in case. I plan to. I've heard that the American army keeps dead alien bodies and UFOs in secret bases. <laughs> Aliens. There are billions of stars in space. You've got to think that at least a few have civilizations more advanced than ours. I'll bet they visit Earth in UFOs. In 1947, the Army actually announced that they had caught a flying disc-shaped object near Roswell, New Mexico. Maybe you don't know about it, but those Army guys, they all know. Oh, you don't say. Anyway, there's no telling what kind of mystery weapons they might have stashed up there. Watch your back. Apparently, UFOs are connected to cattle mutilations. Cattle mutations? No, 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 no. Not mutations. Mutilations. It's a word I, I like the implication that Snake is just, like, not paying attention at this point. In mysterious ways near the same places where UFOs have been sighted. They say the bodies are drained of blood and the eyeballs and sexual organs are gouged out. Wow, well, when you leave a corpse cut open in a field somewhere, the ground soaks up the blood. Yeah. Hey, we were actually talking about this all the <laughs> It's the fucking, uh, the vulture of bees. Got to them. In some cases, they detected radiation. Radiation? Even in our own town, we had goats that died in strange ways. Some said they saw a monster. A lizard on two legs covered in spines from its head all the way down its back. I wonder if that's what the aliens look like. Or if there was some pet they brought with them. Either way, doesn't sound like a very advanced civilization to me. Well, if you see one... Tell it I said hi. Sure. If it speaks human. UFOs kidnap people, too. You know, alien abductions. You've heard of the heel abduction, right? That couple back in the 60s? So when I first saw the Colibri, I thought it was a UFO. Ah, uh, the Fulton recovery. I know those guys are working with the aliens, even if they wouldn't let me see them. Well, you better not get caught again. Or they'll be experimenting on you. <laughs> I'd take that over torture. What do you think they look like? Completely bald, maybe, with, with gray skin and big black eyes? Or maybe they're four vara tall and wear skirts? Yeah, I kind of doubt it. I'll give you one thing, though. I've never seen anything move like that. Oh, maybe the CIA really did make contact. You see? It's true! I forget the name of it. The, the case will... The family was staying in, like, a cabin, and they apparently got attacked for, like, a few days by aliens. I forget what they call them. But I, li I like those aliens. They just look like goblins. You want to know something? I once met an alien cat. Uh, an alien cat? Yep. It was dark out, so I couldn't see too well. But it was a cat with a huge long tail. Its eyes shined in the dark, too. Most cats' eyes do. At first, I thought it was a regular cat. But then, he started talking to me. Inside my head. Inside your head? He said his name was Altargoso El Baki Munudad. He'd come to Earth from the Andromeda Galaxy to check out Earth's nuclear weapons. This has to be a reference to something. Mankind but I'm not sure what. <laughs> Couldn't possibly launch nukes that far. El Baki said he was watching over us. To make sure we don't destroy our Maybe this is just another cryptid that they're referencing. Ready to join the Space Federation. Mm. It's a shame. This is supposed to be the era of detente. And still we've got people pulling stunts like bringing nukes into peaceful countries. If something I once met a wrong, little girl who said she was from Bombo World. I know. This planet could destroy itself at any time. Cookie isn't from Bombo, she went to Bombo, whatever. You you get the reference, maybe, if you watch those streams. <laughs> Snake, is it true you took a picture of El Colibri? Yep, got it right here. The, the Cookie's Bustle like streams that Melody was doing. Oh, I knew it! Those Yankees are working with the aliens. Uh, I know it kind of looks that way, but... Hey, Snake, can you make me a copy of that? Well, I don't see why not. What for? People pay good money for this stuff. We can use it to raise money for MSF. <laughs> sure, kid. You go out and get us a good price for it. You don't believe me, do you? 
I'll get the money. You'll see. Snake, legend has it. A place called Isla del Monstruo is near Costa Rica. Isla del Monstruo? It was discovered in the 18th century by Caribbean pirates sailing over to the Pacific. And the island in Treasure Island is based on one near Costa Rica, too. Ah, uh, Treasure Island. I remember reading that. You've read it, too? Ah, oh, that makes things easier. In Nicaragua, we too have a story about a group of pirates that encountered a group of pirates. out at sea. Some even say they landed on this monster island, though we still don't know exactly where it is. That's the reason I've always wanted to Does come Godzilla to Does Godzilla exist in the Metal Gear universe? I see. Ooh, ooh, I heard another story about a talking cat that lives somewhere in Costa Rica. They say it'll take you to this place. Oh, interesting stuff. Want to know more about the island? Maybe later. If I'm headed that way, you can fill me in. Okay, just let me know. Amanda's so bossy. It's always follow me or, or stay here. The other day she told me, chew your Cayo Pinto before you swallow. <laughs> can you believe it? Knowing your sister? Yeah, I can. The enemy could strike at any time. I can't sit around taking my sweet time eating. I'm a Sandinista, just like the others. I don't need some woman telling me what to Whoa. do. Whoa! Some woman? She's your sister. Okay, Chico, she calm do down. She can to fill your father's shoes. No, I know, but lately she hasn't been doing so good. I should be strong for her. Now you're talking. That's true. Yeah, they mentioned it as a movie. I want to believe that Godzilla is real in this universe, though. <laughs> I want Snake to team up with, like, Mothra. Guerrilla warrior. We pledge our lives to our country and its people. I'm ready to die, too, if I have to. You sure? You better believe it. Snake like keeping Mothra's, like, guardians in his pocket. <laughs> Jay said it first. My dad used to tell us all kinds of stories. About General Sandino and his fight against La Guardia. About my mom before she left us. You didn't want to go with her. It's not like that. La have y'all watched... First. That's I'll let him finish. <laughs> I wish you could see her, though. Oh, no. But I know I'll see her again when this is all over. Somehow, I, I just know it. When I do, me and my mom and papa are all going to live together again. At least... At least that's what I thought. Now, I... Hang in there, Chico. Your sister needs you. Okay. Anyway. Godzilla. <laughs> Have y'all seen the, the Netflix Godzilla that was out like a few... Well, a few years ago at this point. The like sci-fi one in space. I ended up actually liking that one quite a bit. <laughs> it's weird, but I liked it. I need to go and watch the, um, the newer one that has, a uh, Jet Jaguar, because that one also looks good. I should watch more, more Godzilla stuff in general. And Ultraman, and a bunch of other, like, kaiju stuff. Have you ever heard, shoot, coward, you're only going to kill a man? Jay's last words. He'd been captured in Bolivia and said it to the soldiers just as they were about to execute him. Hey, che. He was something, wasn't he? Coming up with a line like that, knowing he was about to die. After the Cuban Revolution, Che gave up his position in the new government to aid in revolutions in other countries. He knew he could die at any time. And he was ready for it. Me? Couldn't even take a little torture. But you've been reborn. As an hombre nuevo. Right, Chico? Right. It's... A lot of people don't like, like, CGI anime stuff. And it's pretty cheesy, but... It's, uh, the, the Netflix Godzilla is about... Like, Godzilla was unstoppable, so people just had to flee off. 
and leave Godzilla to, to, to have control over the entire planet. And then they eventually come back and like try to try to defeat him. And there's like alien races that are also helping. It's interesting. Don't you ever get lonely living away from your mom? Not really. My compas are my family now. A lot of them are from the same village as me. So you had plenty of people to take care of you. Take care of me? I'm a warrior, like any other Sandinista. We look out for each other. That is how it works. Uh, sorry. Guess I misspoke. I was scattered because of that colibri. Wonder where everybody went. Hey, Snake. If you see any Frente prisoners, please, you gotta get them out, okay? Those guys are solid, every one. You could use them in MSF. Hey, Snake, are there any jobs for me here at Mother Base? I can do anything. You don't have to work, you know. <laughs> I can do anything. Kid, I'm a man. Chaos, chaos. Okay, then. What are you good at? Hmm, let me think. Uh, everything. Pull me on any team. I can pull my own way. <laughs> well, you are young. You'll probably be a fast learner. Now think of something. Anything you need, boss. You'll see. I can fight as good as anybody. So I believe, now that we've listened to all the Chico stuff, we should be able to go and do the Monster Hunter mission now. starting to sense your feelings about nukes are a little different from your colleagues. How do you mean? Your little chat with Coldman back there. I... told you my father worked on the Manhattan Project, right? You're familiar with it? The basics, yeah. It was the project that kicked off the nuclear age. That's right. Some of the finest minds of the 20th century, including multiple Nobel Prize winners, worked on it. They spent over two billion dollars, and that's in 1940s money. It culminated in the successful nuclear test at Alamogordo on July 16, 1945. And the first use in combat a few weeks later. <sighs> Doc? I can't walk. What? My spine isn't shaped like everybody else's. I can't move my lower body. So I've never taken a single step, not since oh, I was born. That's unrelated, that Yui. <laughs> your dad being the Manhattan Project. As a result of his research, my father was exposed to high doses of radiation. It can't be a coincidence that my chromosomes are messed up. Uh, mm. That's... That's why I didn't want for these nukes to be another sword of Damocles. I wanted to give them a real purpose. To be a deterrent against war. Doc. And Coldman... We have to stop him. Whatever it takes. So... I've played Metal Gear Solid Five. I know what Huey's like in that game. They don't really give him much to work with. Like, if you don't know anything about him, he's kind of confusing. So this is probably, like, going to be the most interesting of the tapes to me. And that alone is like, oh, so you're, like, the exact opposite of... of Otacon. Otacon didn't want to have anything to do with nukes. But Huey's like, no, we need nukes to be useful, which is interesting. August 6, 1945, Hiroshima. August 9, Nagasaki. The atom bomb attacks on Japan. My father was married to his work. I don't have a single memory of going places or doing stuff with him on weekends. But even as a kid, I knew on some level that it was for his family. I respected him. My mother used to tell me all the time, your father is a brilliant scientist. He saved countless American boys from death. You should be proud of him. Yeah. You could say the war ended because of those bombs. When I was in the fifth you could. grade, a Japanese... <laughs> you could also say it would have ended anyway. She showed me photos of Hiroshima after the bomb. I couldn't believe my eyes. A city of over 350,000 people reduced to a scorch mark on the ground by a single atomic bomb. Houses blown off their foundations, burned to ashes. 
The only things left standing were the skeletons of steel-framed buildings. It wasn't just the buildings. Blackened corpses on the side of the road. Survivors covered head to toe in severe burns. Within a few months, over 70,000 had died in Nagasaki. Twice that in Hiroshima. For years after that, I couldn't talk to my father. Couldn't even stand to look at his face. I know how you feel, Doc. But your father's your father. Fuck if he that. hadn't worked on that project, my body wouldn't be like this. I could be researching something else. I could have lived a normal life. <sighs> Why? Mm. He, uh... The fact he takes all that and makes it about him is kind of shitty. Yeah, thousands upon thousands of people died. Innocent people. But I can't walk. It wasn't so long ago the world stood on the brink of nuclear war. Just over on the other side of the Caribbean. I was 17 at the time. I'd skipped a few grades and was a sophomore at MIT. I remember feeling kind of apathetic about the news that came in every day. It seemed clear to me that as long as they had a grasp of the concept of nuclear deterrence, there was nothing to fear. Hmm, either that, or they were fanning that fear on purpose. As a way to secure a bigger defense budget? Huh, I could see that. But if that was their plan, it kind of backfired. Because it ushered in the era of detente between East and West. Coldman's really gonna do it this time. Once the nuclear genie is out of the bottle, the yoke of deterrence is going to be meaningless. People will die. Cities will burn. We have to stop him now before it's too late to turn back. So you've been doing nuclear research your whole life? No, not really. At first I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. For me, the Sputnik launch was a good shock, not a bad one. I thought the age when science was used for war was over, and that a glorious age of space exploration was dawning. The year I skipped ahead and got into MIT, is it bad into orbit, which made me that I kind of want the Metal Gear games course, set in space? Even back then, I knew the space race was just another facet of the Cold War. Mm, Moscow had a leg up on us, and we were desperate to catch up. I know, but for me, it was a happy time. I joined NASA, got to do the kind of research I loved. Our nation's prestige hinged on our work. They gave us whatever resources we asked for. I knew you could If they do have a do of a vengeance to too, I can see that happening way. actually. But they kind they of set it up. So much. It didn't last long though. The space and nuclear <laughs> arms races took up enormous sums of money. America beat Russia to the moon, but that's where it ended. Then came detente. Exactly. NASA's budget was slashed as a result. My father being a nuclear expert and all, they put me to work on a more obvious deterrent. Missiles. At NASA, I'd been researching a locomotion system for lunar exploration. Tires aren't suited to driving around on the moon, you know. And that's how I caught Coldman's eye. I think... So space actually has, like, a pretty big impact on the setting. Um, because the boss went to space and it changed her, her um, like, her view of the, the world. Same with the Fury, but in a, in a different way. Without spoiling too much, in The Vengeance, um, they set up a character who is working on rockets. And like uh, upper atmosphere travel and stuff like that. So the the pieces of though that they could do something, but I also feel like humanity being constrained to Earth also kind of has a a big impact on the setting. So I don't know. I'm getting, I'm getting lost in my own thoughts about that now. <laughs> but you know, there's something I've never been able to figure out. Is the Cold War really a war, or is it really peace? 
Doc, what do you hope? People called it a cold war, but I don't Okay, know. cause. <laughs> sure, nuclear stockpiles are increasing. Threats are multiplying. The U.S. and the Soviet Union have enough power to destroy the human race a hundred times over. But nobody's actually being killed. Small-scale conflicts and proxy wars, maybe. But nuclear deterrence has averted another world war. The world's far more peaceful today than it was before. And the breakthroughs we've made in space exploration, thanks to Cold War competition? Fantastic, don't you think? No. We didn't need to rush into space like that. Going into space may have been mankind's dream, but good people were sacrificed in the scramble. Maybe so. NASA's definitely got some skeletons in its closet. Same goes for the nuclear arms race. Atomic testing has killed civilians and exposed thousands to radiation. Believe me, I know. And now, this. What peace was I trying to protect anyway? The more I think hey, about yeah. it, the less I understand. Game Boss is also irradiated, so he should have opinions about some of this stuff. <laughs> Making some good points on space and MGS. I wonder if Death Stranding will ever get into that. I've beaten Death Stranding, the original version. I don't remember. Because they talk about space a little bit in that game, but I can't remember how deep they get into it. And I don't know what else they've added to uh, the director's cut, so maybe. They might get into that a bit more than, than I remember. Also, having played um, Wolfenstein recently, <laughs> I, I have that in mind of like, oh, we can just like go to the moon in games if we want to. Let's speak in hypotheticals for a minute. Say you wanted to make a clone of yourself. A clone? Paramedic had the same idea. It's science fiction. I'm just hypothesizing here. Okay, not a clone then. You have any kids? Nope. Wife? Uh, I've never been tied down. Okay, then. So, we're still talking hypotheticals. Say you had a son who'd inherited your genes. Someone with the same combat abilities as you. Would you challenge him to a fight? <laughs> Not to sound cocky, but I wouldn't want to do that. No telling who'd survive. I'll bet. You picked up on the pupa 5000's combat patterns in seconds. Only with your advice, Doc. If anybody could learn to do it just by listening, it'd be easy. But you, you're a born soldier. Yeah, you must have been born with genes geared for combat. Soldier genes, if you will. Genes uh... geared for combat. I don't care how advanced their research is. You can't blame genes for everything. Blame genes? You think it's funny? What? You think genes have nothing to do with this body I was born with? Uh... I don't know. Look. That fear of facing someone of equal ability in combat, imagine that on a strategic scale. That's the concept of nuclear deterrence. The idea is, when all sides are armed with the destructive power of nuclear weapons, they'll avoid nuclear war in order to prevent mutual annihilation. Milligan also has an issue with, that. like, eugenics. <laughs> so. Exactly. It's so simple in principle. But because it's so simple, whether or not it works properly depends on the people involved. In that sense, what we're looking at now is a malfunction in deterrence theory. Coleman. You got it. Please, Snake, don't let deterrence die. I get that Huey would be like, you motherfucker, I'm like, actually, <laughs> my genes matter a lot, but... Some of these games, oh, a soldier's genes, that stuff is kind of, uh, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about it sometimes. What are we gonna do, Snake? If That's probably why I like Metal Gear Solid 2 the best, back, but we'll get to that. We've the entire MSF out to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, but Peace Walker's missiles have one megaton warhead. The fireball alone would be a mile in diameter. Everything in the vicinity of Ground Zero will be vaporized by the heat. Can get rid of that? <laughs> then there's the blast, which travels at hundreds of miles per hour. And the fires, and the... A huge dose of radiation from the initial nuclear reaction. That, too. There won't be a single survivor. 
Yeah, I'm aware of that. Look, Doc, you made that thing. You know better than anybody what it's capable of. Right now, you've got to give me a rational, scientific estimate of the damage. If we're talking about a nuclear explosion, it's more than just MSF's problem. You're right, Snake. Sorry about that. Like I was saying, Mother Base would be wiped out. Any ships in the area could be caught in the blast, too. We'd need to send out a warning. The thing to worry about most is the fallout. The dust of death. If it goes off over water, the particles will be smaller than with an explosion over land, so the wind will scatter the fallout over a wider area. Clouds will form around the salt crystals in the seawater, causing contaminated rain to fall downwind. Yeah, got a taste of that myself. On Bikini Atoll? That's right. The 1954 Castle Bravo test created fallout 300 miles downwind. Poisoned a lot of local residents and ships, so I hear. The yield of Peace Walker's warheads isn't that big, but the amount of fallout will largely depend on weather conditions. It's impossible to make a quick and easy estimate. If it gets into the trade winds, it could come straight to Costa Rica. What was it Coldman was saying? About leaving people free to help out? He's out of his mind. What does he think's gonna happen? When they get hit by rain containing high concentrations of fallout, a lot of them will die from the external exposure alone. The rain will seep into the ground, contaminating the water supply and crops. When they ingest the stuff, the internal exposure starts. Strontium-90 and cesium-137 have half-lives of around 30 years. Conversations like this also make me wish Metal Gear Survive was good. Cataracts, dermatitis, cancer. And it affects reproduction. Because, like, a post apocalyptic now, Metal Gear could also be really cool if it was an actual Metal Gear game. People still suffer from exposure to the bomb. We can't let Coldman create more of them just to prove his point. I know it sounds crazy, but I created Peace Walker so that that kind of thing would never happen again. Don't worry, Doc. We'll stop it. One way or another. I was also going to mention, I almost forgot, talking about. Hey, Snake, what if you had kids? Um, I know they ignore portable ops, but Snake had, like, the future told to him in that game. And I kind of wish that they talked about that. Because that game, like, ends with some with a, with a psychic <laughs> telling him about how he's going to fight his kids. And how one of them is going to, like, save the world and one is going to destroy it. All that kind of shit. And when I played that game, I felt like that was one of the most interesting things that game did. But... Most of that game is non-canon, so... Kind of a shame. The aim of the Peace Walker Project is to achieve robust nuclear deterrence across Central America by deploying a new nuclear weapon system along the Caribbean coast. Peace Walker is also the name of the system itself. <sighs> a nuclear weapon named Peace. I can just see the look on Kaz's face. So why exactly does this new system need legs in the first place? Because it's a walker, an unmanned weapon, moving under its own power and capable of launching a deterrent strike from anywhere. That's the whole idea behind Peace Walker. The reason Peace Walker is a mobile nuclear weapon system is to maximize its potential as a nuclear deterrent. How so? If need be, Peace Walker can stay constantly on the move so that the adversary can't pinpoint its position. That allows it to avoid preemptive enemy strikes. So you're saying it keeps I wonder what Huey sounds like in Japanese. Coldman likes to brag about it in this way. I know this like is completely unrelated, but and there's another reason for them to be mobile. Peace Walker also has a self-destruct... I feel like they made Huey a lot more, like, traditionally attractive than Otacon was. So I wonder if his voice was a lot more, like, mature-sounding than, than just having the Otacon voice. Why would Peace Walker need a self-destruct function? You saw it, didn't you, Snake? That sphere on Peace Walker's head? Yeah. That's a hydrogen bomb. Uh -oh. What? You're telling me that thing's a thermonuclear device? 
Do they have any idea what kind of destruction that thing so would cause? They probably I shouldn't know, shoot it's that. Crazy. <laughs> I mean, even overkill has its limits. If it's strategic value they want, they could have gone with something smaller. It's like they want a weapon on par with Russia's Tsar Bomba. This arms race is running way out of control. It's an evolutionary dead end. A saber-toothed tiger. You can't load a warhead that big on a missile, of course. And no strategic bomber could carry it. That's where Peace Walker comes in. So, it waltzes into enemy territory carrying a hydrogen bomb and blows itself up. Christ. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's one way to do it. <laughs> the biggest nuclear warhead ever actually detonated was the Soviet RDS-220, <clears throat> nicknamed Tsar Bomba. It had an estimated yield of 57 megatons, 10 times as much power as all the explosives used throughout World War II. The test took place on October 30, 1961, above Novaya Zemlya. The explosion is believed to have created a fireball over two miles in diameter. Jeez. Can you believe that? Like a miniature sun. The explosion was seen as far off as Finland, 600 miles away. And some people even reported windows shattering. The shock wave traveled three times around the Earth. Three times. <laughs> Peace Walker is armed with That's a not... massive hydrogen bomb, even more destructive than Tsar Bomba. It can sneak into enemy territory. That's an actual thing. Low. And in the event of an enemy nuclear strike, detonate itself in retaliation. And the that is an actual thing. Okay. Do that. My research. Snake. Those legs Jesus. were supposed to make my dream come true. And now they're about to jump the fence of nuclear deterrence. You have to stop them. I'll apply all my energy into developing weapons and equipment to help you do it. Sounds like a deal. Sorry, I'm, lo I'm looking into this now. <laughs> ah, fucking Web P. Okay. I was going to pull up a, a map of the... the radius. But you can you can look it up on your own. That's fucked up. <laughs> That's scary. What made you put an AI in the Peace Walker? Well, for one thing, because it can't be manned. Peace Walker so fucked up. <laughs> True. That's a given, I guess, but. You can't put a when you actually like explain blow at any time. like the and details of it, it makes so it even it more, you know, instead. more real. Strangely humane of you. And besides, Peace Walker was designed as a bipedal weapon system. You can't imagine how hard it shakes when it walks. It'd turn a man into mush. Plus, when launching a nuclear missile, it has to perform ballistic calculations in real time. See? Because it's always moving. Hold on. I would love to if see that. It does, then a high performance in person, do the job. but it's still scary. <laughs> Intelligence. That's a very good point, Snake. Which brings me to the real reason. Peace Walker needs AI to make decisions. This game really got me scared of nukes back in the day. Then I guess it's doing its job. It's <laughs> I think that's like the one thing Kojima consistently tries to do. I've heard all this before. You want to war Even in fucking Death Standing. We'd never actually launch the first. But like, hey, nukes. It's strictly a counterattack system. Only a politician could make such an illogical decision as starting a nuclear war. First, <laughs> That's a good line. <laughs> if an adversary launches a nuke at us, the AI will not fail to retaliate. Therefore, Only a politician could do something so launch. stupid. The AI guarantees it. Even so, launching nukes without authorization? Boomer captains have the authority to launch if land communications <laughs> are called. captains. It's the same principle. Not even the captain of a boomer can make that decision alone. The way I heard it, that's the only situation where insubordination is Aye, aye, Boomer. Only because humans are imperfect. That's Coldman's line of thinking. You're saying that machines don't make mistakes? That's a myth. Worse than that, it's blind faith. We wouldn't put our faith, our fate, into the hands of any ordinary machine. 
That's what the AI is for. I was about to say something stupid. To launch a retaliatory strike requires high level judgment. I was about to say, <laughs> I wonder if, if new Metal Gear games came out, if they would deal with AI, because AI is like a, a normal thing nowadays. Um, I forgot about some of the games that already exist. Oh, I missed one. Nope. Why is this one... Oh, these are all... Okay, never mind. Nope. The reason... Peace Walker is fitted with several close-range weapons. We'd also planned for it to be able to enter enemy territory and self-detonate. Wonderful. What exactly are we dealing with here? Well, the flamethrowers, for one thing. One in the front and one in the rear. Then there are the S-mines. They're like cluster bombs. It scatters them from its leg hatches. If you see those open, you better clear out quickly. And finally, the rockets. These can travel quite a distance, so stay sharp. On the other hand, it can't fire them from too close. But then again, there are those flamethrowers. It can also use its legs as weapons against any infantry on the ground. Ouch. But remember, <laughs> Peace Walker technically... Ouch. <laughs> With just the reptile pod, it can only perform relatively simple maneuvers. They've got certain quirks, too. What's more, look carefully, and you should be able to predict which attack is coming next. Snake! You have to stop Peace Walker from launching that nuke. Calm down. What do I need to do? To tell you the truth, I don't really know. It's real that these... The mammal pod is oh, well, I guess it would be playing before the mission. And mobility. The S mines, rockets, this feels like something that should be playing during the, the mission, but, I don't know but what else it's to say. not. You'll just have to stay sharp and watch for how it behaves before each of the attacks. I'll give it a shot. There's no time for anything else. Sorry, I can't be more helpful. You can do it, Snake. Okay, but why does Peace Walker need to walk on two legs? I think treads would be good enough. You'd be wrong. As you know, the terrain in Central America is rugged and complex, especially along the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica. You've got jungles, swamps, mountains, and the only way to get across all that terrain, no matter how rugged, is on legs. Yeah, but wouldn't it be tough to cross a swamp, even on legs? It wasn't easy, that's for sure. The reason we picked Costa Rica as a proving ground is because we can test it on every type of terrain. I just had a thought. I'm still thinking about Metal Gear in space. <laughs> that would pretty much just be that famous, um, I think Command and Conquer line of Tim Curry. The only place not corrupted by capitalism. Space! This Peace Walker project the CIA is talking about. You believed in it, huh? Yeah, I believed. Actually, maybe I just wanted to believe. What do you mean? Here's how Coldman explained it. Peace Walker's a weapon for peace. One to ensure true nuclear deterrence. It'd be the anchor to bring stability to Central America. He told me, the nuclear weapon system you've built will never be used. It will forever stand vigil as an icon of peace. And to achieve that, he needed my bipedal locomotion technology. To be honest, I was flattered. Flattered? Wouldn't you be? My colleagues in the scientific community have never taken me seriously. They told me bipedal locomotion was a pipe dream, that it'd never amount to anything. It was the first time anybody recognized my work. How could I not be happy? And besides, it was my chance to surpass my father. To create nukes for peace. Or so I thought, anyway. But Coldman's really going through with it. Nukes yeah. for peace sounds like a really he bad charity. Really. No one would give the project any notice unless they could prove that an unmanned system is capable of launching a nuke. Why is Coldman gonna launch a nuke? If all he wants to do is prove the AI retaliation system works, he doesn't need to put a live warhead on it. I agree. 
He could demonstrate the system by launching the missile alone, without a warhead. I asked him the same thing at first. He said there was no point in using a dummy missile. That it'd take an actual nuclear launch to deter potential enemies. Launching the real deal gives him a leg up in negotiations with Langley. That's what he's really after. I based the bipedal locomotion technology used in Peace Walker on Soviet research. Actually, I'll be honest with you. He stole it. I stole most of the yeah. basic <laughs> ideas behind it. Soviet? Bipedal? You mean Granin? You know him? Oh. Yeah. He said it was an accent that time. Lab in Russia. Granin. He helped me out a little bit. You met him? What were you... He was head of the Granin Design Bureau. Creator of countless Soviet weapons. I'd hit a wall in my research at the time. Granin's Didn't they? Granin's ideas solved nearly all my problems. Uh, there's nothing unusual about using somebody else's Didn't work. Didn't they know each other? Research is there. As long as you cite it, yeah. But I wasn't in a position to do that. His research was classified at the highest level. Soviet research, no less. So, you used it without telling anybody. I wanted to show up my colleagues for once. The ones who never took me seriously. But you reap what you sow. Coldman seized on that vulnerability. Told me if I quit the project, he'd expose yeah. my larceny. Yeah. He had you by the balls, Doc. How'd you get your hands on Granit's research? That was also Coldman. He used his agency contacts to get a hold of it. Uh, giving you stolen information. Then using it to blackmail you. Damn. Oh, did Granin know his work the dad? I saw it. See, I'd been corresponding with him for a oh, while. Oh, okay, then, yeah. Letters. Between scientists doing the same kind of research. But... He always complained that nobody understood his ideas on bipedal locomotion. Ah, so you're the American I'm a little confused. talking about. Obviously, he didn't write a word about the technology. I thought they had, like, a photo Except together. one time. If by chance anything should happen to me, I entrust my research to you. Better that than handing it over to these ignorant so-called scientists. <laughs> Sounds like him, all right. Then one day, his papers actually came. It wasn't hard for me to imagine what had happened to him. I felt it was my duty to carry on his work after him. But he also had, like, a zone of the end also, <laughs> what? statues, so... Maybe combining his technology with mine could be a way to bring East and West together, like the docking of Apollo and Soyuz. It'll never make the history books, and it's still not a reason to plagiarize. You're right. You're absolutely right. I never had the courage to tell the truth, that's all. I always looked for excuses to cover it up. Until now. Huh? You told me everything. You're no longer a coward. Well... Well, let's not be too nice, a Snake. Metal Gear. Uh, Metal Gear. What about it? You mumbled that when I first explained about Peace War. I'm curious what it meant. Exactly what it says. Uh, Metal Gear. Granin coined the term. Granin did? He thought of his technology as the metal gear that meshes infantry with artillery. I like the sound of that. Metal gear. It's got a nice ring to it. Better than an outright lie like Peace Walker, anyway. I like that they're actually kind of making it make sense. When he said that in Metal Gear Solid 3, it was still kind of stupid and didn't make a whole lot of sense. Ganon kind of said it as like, um... Like the missing link. Like an evolutionary step between, like, human and machine. But they're doing a better job of actually making it make sense now. Those papers the CIA gave you, was there any data on the Shagohod in there? Shagohod? A nuclear tank that launches IRBMs. It competed against grounding system for approval. Oh, the thing with the rockets! Designed by a guy named Sokolov, right? <laughs> What's so funny? No, I was just remembering some of the commentary Granin added to the Shagohod papers. You should have seen the way he badmouthed it. It was too conservative, too ugly. I love the Shagohod. He was so angry when he wrote that, he smeared up the ink. 
And you know how shoddy the paper is over there to begin with. How bad? That's grinding, all right. Imagine accelerating the launcher itself to 300 miles an hour to extend the range of an IRBM. As stupid as it sounds, it's a hell of a concept. Who but the Soviets would think of using a tank as the first stage of a rocket? I actually took a cue from the Shagahad when I developed the pupa. That hovercraft thing? You stole that one, too. Give me a little credit. I only borrowed the concept. The technology is original. As it turned out, hover technology wasn't enough to handle all the terrain in Central America. It relied too much I on... I didn't even realize it was supposed to be hovering. The Shagahad was a major threat. That thing could corner like you wouldn't believe. Built pretty tough, too. You sure know a lot about it. Uh, it almost did me in. I couldn't forget it if I tried. Did you in? So you were the one who took it down. Wow! You really are amazing. I didn't do it alone. No, seriously, thank you. We might not be here today if they'd begun mass-producing that thing. Then again, they're hard at work now miniaturizing nuclear warheads. Pretty soon they won't even need an accelerated launcher like the Shagahad. Great. That means they're that much closer to being able to launch from I anywhere in the world. I want Biden to fight a Shagohod. Metal Gears are cool. I like Vex. I like Vey. I like most Metal Gears. But Shagohod is so fucking cool. I also, if anyone knows where to get like a cheap like figure of a Shagohod or a pupa, let me know, because <laughs> I would love to have one. Love to have one to display. Actually, I bet you could 3D print one pretty easily. Just like get the model and and print it out. Chico called Peace Walker the Basilisco. Basilisco? Oh, right, Spanish. <laughs> That's funny. I once used the code name Basilisk for the Peace Walker platform myself. What for? The class of lizards called basilisks can walk atop any type of terrain. In a pinch, they can even stand up on two legs and run across water. Perfect name for a system that can walk anywhere in Central America, right? Plus, there are the legends. What legends? The basilisks of legend were highly venomous creatures. There's a story told by the ancient Romans. A knight slew a basilisk by piercing it with his spear. The creature's poison seeped up the spear and killed both horse and rider. Remind you of anything, Snake? Nuclear deterrence. Bingo. Kill it, and you die along with it. Your hands are bound. I wanted Peace Walker to be like that. You should know that people aren't that rational. Sometimes people do things that don't make sense, even when they know they're going to die. Or maybe it's because of that. Maybe you're right. But that's exactly what I don't understand. Peace Walker contains an assembly of two AI pods. One of them is the mammal pod, which Dr. Strangelove developed. The other's the reptile pod, which is mine. What's the difference? The reptile pod is the attitude control AI. If it's destroyed, Peace Walker grinds to a halt. The mammal pod is responsible for making the decisions regarding nuclear retaliation. Reflex and thought. One is the brainstem and cerebellum, the other the cerebrum. So, the one that houses the will of the boss would be the mammal pod. Please talk about Hatsune Miku. Please talk about Hatsune Miku. <laughs> we call it the reptile pod for a reason. The parts of our brains that govern basic life and reflex developed ages ago, when our ancestors were still reptiles. We were reptiles? Well, only at one stage of our evolution. The theory was proposed by the neuroscientist Paul McLean. Huh. The reptile brain corresponds to the brainstem and basal ganglia in our brain. The reptile pod also incorporates the functions of the cerebellum. So basically, it's the deep parts of the brain. Dr. Strangelove came up with the name. Ah. Oh. The part of our brain that developed after we became mammals is responsible for high-level brain functions. Such as? Such as intelligence, judgment... Is this stuff still, like, recognized, by the way? High-level, all right. 
location wise, the mammal brain like the reptile and mammal brain. That feels like something that people would say is not a real thing anymore. I think it's very telling that Dr. Strangelove named her pod Mammal. It's almost like she wants it to be more than just an advanced AI. What she really wants is for it to have a mind of its own. Electronic cigarettes, huh? Hey, Doc. What was that you were smoking in the lab? It looked like a cigarette, but it wasn't lit. Oh, it's an electronic cigarette. It's a vape, Snake. Pretty neat, huh? Electronic cigarette. Yep, a liquid in the filter that turns into vapor, and you inhale the microparticles. So that was vapor. I'd actually rather be smoking <laughs> normal cigarettes, but not in that room. The smoke would wreck the precision equipment in there, ruin all its wiring. But the vapor is just steam. It doesn't contain tar you or anything like that. You can blow fat clouds, Snake. So I can smoke it in the lab with no worries. Nice. Wanna try one? Nah, I'll stick with <laughs> You wanna rip? Yeah, but... I don't like imitations. The real thing's always better. Okay. But you know, sooner or later, smoking's gonna become very unfashionable across the world. It hurts you and those around you. Electronic cigarettes might not seem so bad then. Yeah, when that happens, True. I'll think about it. You said your dad was involved in the Manhattan Project, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not surprising at all that Huey vapes. He's absolutely that kind of person. Actually, you know, probably not. So far, nobody's found. I only don't believe that he's not like way into it. Causes genetic defects in children. Except for those exposed in the womb. Epidemiologically speaking, anyway. That's the conclusion of the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission. Right. The ABCC commenced its study immediately after the war, and it's still ongoing. I'm just thinking Huey, Huey was one of those, like, massive... The effects of radiation exposure last massive long vape long. rigs that looks like a steampunk nightmare. A real verdict on whether it affects genes. Granted, it's the most massive study anybody's ever done. But that's really all it is, a study. The ABCC brought in bomb victims and ran tests on them, but they didn't treat them. Really? Them too, huh? At any rate, that's what my father made me believe when I was growing up. Maybe it was tough for your dad to explain. Ever think of that? Yeah, maybe. But this is my problem now, Snake. I have to face the nukes head on, whether I like it or not. My creations are being used for the wrong purposes. The onus is on me to stop it somehow. Help me, Snake. I've actually tried to vape a couple times. It's fine. <laughs> but I don't smoke, so... It's dangerously easy <laughs> to, to vape, so I try to stay away from it. Hey! As long as I'm here at Mother Base, why not assign me to the R&D team? You could use a guy like me. Glad to have you on board. I'm sure Kaz is, too. Once I've got the necessary materials and design specs together, I should be able to start building you that bipedal weapon platform. Nothing would make me happier than for my research to help put a stop to Peace Walker. Just gonna straight up talk about a movie, okay. <laughs> Not surprised, so but okay. Strange Love was at NASA. Yeah, well, actually, Strange Love left for DARPA not long after I joined. And then the two of you ended up back together doing research in Costa Rica. Not exactly together. We coordinated on a few things, but the research projects themselves were separate from each other. We had it worked out so that Dr. Strange Love handled the mammal pod, Peace Walker's cerebrum, while I did the rest. That letter, something to do with your research? Huh? Uh, well, no, it's a... Uh, yeah, it's a report. Research findings. Research findings? Anything in there we could use against Peace Walker? Nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> Just don't read it, okay? Promise me you won't. Isn't the biggest vape, vape company banned now in the USA? I haven't kept up with the news. Um... I don't know. The thing about that is that there's so many, like, small companies and brands that 
they would have to like ban them outright for it to really do anything meaningful. I think some did get shut down, but I don't, I don't know. Did you, um, give that letter to Dr. Strangelove? Uh, no. Why not? I gave it to you for a reason. It's highly important information. Sorry. I didn't exactly have an opportunity to play postman. Well, next time you see her, you make sure she gets it. Oh, yeah, sure. Better for you if she doesn't. Snake! What? Tell me you didn't read the letter. No, no. You <laughs> did! I mean... You never know what kind of information could affect the outcome of an operation, right? So, I... So you read the letter, after <laughs> I specifically told you not to. What do you expect people to do when you tell them not to read something? I thought I knew you, Snake. I thought I could trust you. But now I see I was wrong. <sighs> Look, I'm sorry, but I just don't get what you see in her. I well, do. I, I do a lot. I <laughs> a barbarian who opens other people's private correspondence to understand. Fine then. Deliver it yourself. Huh? What? No, no, no. I, no, no way. I could never... Uh, you've got a long way to go, Huey. Also, it's never going to happen, Huey. <laughs> You ever see the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey? Can't say I have. Fantastic flick. The outer space special effects are incredible enough, but the depiction of AI is what really stands out. There's an AI? Yeah, a spacecraft pilot AI called HAL. It plays a major role in the story. Dr. Strangelove loves it too. Did I ever tell you about the time we first met up in Costa Rica? No. You know how she hates men, right? Mm -hmm. So we uh, hadn't seen each other mm -hmm. since NASA, and we just yeah, were know. it off. <laughs> until we started talking about how. And then she started going off. The way she talked about it was so intellectual. The way she analyzed every plot detail, how passionate she was about the AI. It made me fall for her all over again. Can we... uh, you know what? Here's to Hal for bringing her and me closer together. You should we... ask her about 2001 too. Then you'll understand just how amazing she is. Can we... Amazing, huh? Hal. Now there's a good name. Um, hmm. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. It was... no, even back then, you should have been able to understand. Uh. Being an unmanned vehicle, the Chrysalis can perform extreme G-force maneuvers that standard aircraft can't. It'll be difficult to counterattack once it's coming at you. I should mention that it's also equipped with a railgun. A what? A weapon that fires rounds using electromagnetic force in lieu of gunpowder. Wait, an electric weapon? Uh, not exactly. The rounds themselves are conventional shells. It creates force by running an electric current through a magnetic field. Fleming's left hand rule. Did left hand rule. rule. Not at mine. Oh. Anyway, Magnetism. as the railgun uses false. electromagnetic force, it needs to charge before firing. Once you see it starting to charge, take immediate Wash away advantage. the anger. <laughs> also, as with the pizza, destroying the AI will put the unit out of commission. Do enough damage and it'll have to land. Use that opportunity to get in the AI pot. Wait too long and it'll start to repair itself. Be sure to shoot the hatch the moment it lands. I think I can handle that. Kojima definitely found a way to make Huey unlikable after people thought Alicorn was cool. True. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about that being the reason. We've already listened to Cocoon. So, that's kind of what I meant. Playing Metal Gear Solid V, I didn't get why he was supposed to be so unlikable. He was unlikable, but I didn't get why he was so bad. And even now, he's not as bad as he gets, but...
you can you can see what kind of person he is <laughs> just from some of these interactions. That was some escape he made from Strangelove's lab. Security inside was not so tight. The door to my room was locked from the outside, of course. But she took off the blindfold at that time. So she could wash my hair. Huh. Pretty luxurious treatment for a prisoner. Hmm, wasn't it? She wouldn't undo the handcuffs, but she washed my body for me. Um... And with such gentle care. Uh... Why'd you run away? Didn't she say you could go home in a month? If your escape attempt failed, you'd be in greater danger than hmm. before. I was supposed to be giving a presentation on the distribution of Costa Rican bird species at the conference. The date was approaching. Anyway. <laughs> so, I pretended I had to use the toilet and made my escape. I found an ID card and searched everywhere for my equipment and my tape. But a soldier saw me. It was a miracle I managed to get away. There was no time to find the tape. I do not care about the conference. I'm lucky enough to still be in one piece. You bounce back quick. You don't? Not sure. I try not to dwell too much on the past, but... Then don't. There is no point. I'm so glad to be out of there. I never felt safe, you know? Tell me about it. Well, I think she's interested in women. <laughs> and I yes, think I? she took a fancy to me. Oh. Mm. Well, that's, um... Huh. Besides... It is much nicer here. I'm also going to save before I do the rest of these. That was a lot. I mean, I'm glad they're actually just like outright saying it. Because <laughs> it seems like the kind of game where they would dance around. Stuff like that. Snake. Was it just the two women in the lab? Mm, most of the time, we. Oui. And one of them. You only heard her voice, right? Yes, that is correct. Such a wonderful voice. Okay. It sent chills up my spine. What was the other woman like? Ah, don't even think about it. She's not the slightest interest in men. No, it's part of my <laughs> mission to... <laughs> Only teasing. Let me think. I believe she was in her thirties. Pretty, with a good sense of style, but... Austere in her tastes. A very unusual woman. And she was doing research on AI. AI? So that is what she was up to. You know, she did say something interesting. That people should not be going into space. That it is too dangerous. Mm. Mm. An automated control system for rockets, then. She said something about wanting to... Get closer to her dying wish. I think she must have been talking about an old lover. Lover? You mean another woman? Huh? <laughs> My! Aren't we curious about the women and other women? You want to hear the terrible things she tried to do to me? That's not what I meant. It's all right. You can be honest. <sighs> you do seem to get along awfully well together. <laughs> no, no. Not at all. I think you're hiding something. <sighs> Never mind. Aren't you supposed to be looking for the capsule? Here, I'll demonstrate its call for you. We did that already. <laughs> I knew it. So, that's actually kind of interesting if Strangelove was saying... Like, talking about the possibility of someone going to space to further understand the boss. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to be thinking a lot about space tonight. <laughs> Let's go over this one more time. First, 
I need an ID card to get into the lab. That is correct. From the outside, it looks like any other room. But on the inside, it is a state-of-the-art research facility. And your ID card got taken away from you by some guy in an orange jacket. Exactly. I had a castle singing nearby. It has not <laughs> been that long since it happened. Hmm. It could be tricky if he's out on patrol. But if he's a stationary sentry, you don't think the Quetzal's move? Its nest is probably nearby. I do not think it will go away anytime soon. Good. I'll get on looking for that soldier. If you forget what it sounds like, I will do the call She's for you again. She's Finch. She's used to this kind of stuff. <laughs> anytime you'd like to hear it. Yeah, I'll do that. Let me get this straight. You were in Costa Rica as a bird watcher? Yes, I was. Not for pleasure, though. I am a researcher, after all. I am studying the distribution of Latin American bird species. With today's compact cassette tape recorders, even a woman like me can carry her recording equipment by herself. But it was a mistake to come alone. Hmm. Even so, there sure are a lot of wild birds in Costa Rica. Hmm. Aren't there? Over 800 different species. Said to be more than 10% of all living bird species on Earth. How many can you name, Mr. Ornithologist? Well, hey, I was just trying not to scare you. You should at least have a basic knowledge of Costa Rica. How about this? I will give you a thorough education, Mr. First Time Ornithologist. Uh, uh okay. Start by telling me about the Quetzal. Cecile, what's that machine you said you used to make those recordings of yours? A cassette, um, something or other. A cassette recorder. Or a cassette densuke, as they say in Japan. Yeah, that. Japan. What is that thing, anyway? A portable recording device released last year by a Japanese company. Sony. It uses compact cassettes, making it far lighter than open reel machines. It still weighs five kilograms, but the exercise won't kill me. <laughs> it is user friendly too. All the buttons have markings on them, allowing you to operate it without looking at it. <laughs> Can you imagine missing the shot of a lifetime simply because you blinked? Oh, that would be devastating. But where'd they come up with Densuke? Sounds like a Japanese name. It's because it me is. To that one. Cause? Densuke is a nickname that comes from the name of an old manga character. Oh. Uh, was he some recording nerd, too? Don't give me that. Recording atmospheric noises is an exhilarating art. There's nothing like capturing the real world in action on tape. It's just like taking pictures with a camera, only with a microphone instead of a viewfinder. Oh, uh, sure. Listen to a tape with your eyes closed. And the scene just bursts to life in your mind's eye. Tell him, Cecile. Ah, absolutely. When I listen to the sounds of the birds in my apartment, it is like I am back in the forest where I recorded them. See? She's a Parisian. She knows what's chic. If you say so. And what do you like to record, Monsieur Miller? Me? Steam locomotives. No question. The roar of the engine. Oh no, he's a, he's a train load. More animal than machine. Uh, don't get me started. Steam locomotives are a dying breed in Japan. I wouldn't mind going back for a bit and making some new tapes while I still can. Oh, you are less civilized than I thought. L less civilized? I detest those beasts. The noise frightens off all the birds. Then there is the smoke. I much prefer the peace and quiet of the forest. Uh, Cecile, wait. That... That came out wrong, <laughs> I... <laughs> sure it did. Okay, chat. What's a go-to ASMR? <laughs> the closest I get to that is sometimes I listen to, um... Evosong Woods. Atmosphere. To, like, go to sleep to. Though for a while I was also listening to, um... <laughs> the Ebon Hawk. Uh... Atmosphere sounds from Knights of the Old Republic. 
But those are the only two that I would ever listen to, like, consistently. All right. What do you want to know about Ketzels? Hmm. Give me the basics. Something that'll help me find one. Okay, then. First of all, as I'm sure you remember... The Sometimes, like, rain sounds and, like, thunderstorm green, sounds, but, a yeah. A dazzling blend of viridian fading into blue. Its belly is brilliant red. And its tail feathers are white. Such a gorgeous bird. Also, the male has two long decorative feathers. But only during breeding season. Among birds, males are usually more beautiful than females. Like a peacock's tail. Yes, just like that. A chain noise machine? To note that while their bodies are only 40 centimeters long, many cat cells reach over a meter in length when you include their decorative plumage. Did it like actually like manually make, make the sounds? By making holes in dead trees with their beaks, about three to four meters above the ground. They are omnivorous and eat everything from nuts... Because that would be kind of cool, honestly. Where can I find one? Their habitat stretches across the entire tropical cloud forest. You may end up having to rely on its song to find one. Good to know. I will do an imitation. Listen closely. Hey, not bad. Ah, shall I do a chicken next? Cluck, cluck, cluck. No thanks. That's enough. Are you sure? How about a monkey? Yeah, don't need that either. Oh, all right then. Hmm. A noise sleep machine, I think it was looped with coatings? Huh. Because nowadays, <laughs> you can just pull that stuff up on YouTube. you could do a monkey call. Yes? Want to hear it? Yeah, I won't be able to get it off my mind until <laughs> I do. Alright, here it is then. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. I can do others too. Like a sheep, a pig. Yeah? <laughs> I hate this. This is gross. Wow. What about a pig? <laughs> that's uncanny. <laughs> oh, I can do a rabbit as well. A rabbit? Rabbits make noises? Certainly, but they are very faint. So perhaps only someone who has owned one would recognize them. I see. So, what do they sound like? Listen very carefully. Okay. <laughs> Seriously? Rabbits sound like that? I assure you they do. Listen again. Never heard a rabbit do that before. They do. I swear. That was weird. I don't like that one. <laughs> Costa Rica is the home to Somebody many is way into well. stuff like that. The people here call them Calibri. Calibri, huh? Probably Calibri Kojima. are the world's smallest birds. Although they can vary from species to species, most are around 10 centimeters in length, and the smallest, no more than five. It is amazing to think that something so small can still be a fully developed bird. Hmm. I think she is kind of wacky. Mistaken for a bug. Actually, She's clocky. They are often mistaken for sphinx moths. The little darlings feed on flower nectar, and their beaks are long and thin to help them drink up the nectar. They beat their wings far faster than any other bird. The smallest ones, over 70 times a second. Can you imagine? What for? They hover in midair while they suck their nectar. They can even fly straight backwards. Hovering. Like a helicopter. That's why Amanda and her unit called that chopper Colibri. I think it is an insult to the birds to give their names to weapons. Don't you? Don't ask me. Ask the birds how they feel about it. Mannequins. Have you ever heard of the mannequins? Never. Unbelievable! You came all the way to Costa Rica and you've never even heard of them? I didn't come here to look at... Mannequins are known for their beautiful courtship dances. 
The orange-colored mannequin is said to live on the Pacific side. The white-bearded mannequin on the Caribbean I'm side. I'm picturing like and crash the test dummies. the mannequin is in the central basin. The long-tailed mannequins are especially distinctive. What's special about them? First, each young male picks an older male to teach him how to dance. Then, teachers and pupils all get in a group and dance for the females. Hmm. However, only the teachers get paired up with females. The pupils practice their technique for seven years before striking That's out on their own and finding their That's actually really interesting. interesting. <laughs> I guess it takes time to get good at anything, whether it's dancing or soldiering. Mannequins always have plenty to eat. Apparently, that is why they have so much free time to practice dancing. Hmm. Unlike us, obviously. I wonder what would happen if you took them and, like, raised them in captivity. If that would come naturally or not. Or if that's something that is, like, taught to them by other birds. That kind of stuff is always weird to me. Another well-known bird of the cloud forest is the three-wattled bellbird. Wattled? What the hell's a wattle? <laughs> it is just like your beard, Snake. What? It is a piece of flesh that hangs down from its chin. Kind of like whiskers, but not made of hair. A hanging piece of flesh. Oui, and it only grows on males. Nothing more important to a man than his beard. So, these birds are in the cloud forest, too. They are normally found in the lowland rainforest, but they migrate into the highland cloud forest during breeding season. What this rewattled bellbird is best known for, though, is its loud call. It makes these metallic bong and ding sounds. Hence the name bellbird. It hardly sounds like a bird at all. Even an expert bird caller like me cannot do it justice. Oh, it doesn't sound like I'll be mistaking it for a quetzal. Do you know the national bird of Costa Rica? Uh... Honestly, and you call yourself an ornithologist? The national bird of Costa Rica is the clay-colored robin. It's a plain-looking brown bird found throughout the country. Why'd they make it the national bird, then? Are there all kinds of better-looking birds, like the castle? Ah, the clay-colored robin has the most exquisite song. And I think it is part of the Costa Rican national character to choose a bird everyone knows and loves over prettier ones. Somehow these people don't strike me as being very Latin. Speaking what does as an that mean, Snake? <laughs> I am rather happy with that choice. Not all birds have to be pretty. Oh. And I have no idea what he meant by that. <laughs> is the national bird of Guatemala. The scarlet macaw and the great green macaw are also representative birds of Costa Rica. Macaws are a type of parrot. Enormous, stately birds. Macaw. I think I've heard that name somewhere before. <laughs> but of course you have. You are an ornithologist, no? Stop it! <laughs> so, tell me, where do macaws live in Costa Rica today? Oh, come on now. <laughs> I am only teasing you. Macaws live not in the cloud forest, but in the rainforest, on the Pacific side of Costa Rica. In the past, they were a common sight all across the country. But lately, the population has decreased dramatically. One possible cause is the pesticide spread to facilitate large-scale banana cultivation. Evicted from their own land, huh? Thankfully, conservation efforts have been gaining is some momentum lately. Endangered? I feel like I've heard about the macaw like in real life quite a bit. <laughs> Never heard the name Cosima before. Then again, I don't know many people from France. Is it a common name? No, not that common. But Wagner's second wife was named Cosima Francesca Gaetana Wagner. Huh. You know, Kojima is a common last yeah. name in Japan. Okay. Guys, it's just <laughs> funny how, you know, I'm part Japanese and Cecile's middle name is so close to Kojima. It feels like 
destiny unfolding. <laughs> you think so? Oui, oui. That's a beautiful name you have. Cecile Cosima Caminades. Wait a second. Cecile Cosima Caminades. Cosima Caminades. Hey, that's close to... Close to what? Your name. It sounds almost like the sentence Kojima Caminandes in Japanese. And what does it mean, s'il vous plaît? Well, Kami is the word for God in mm. Japanese. Nandesu. <laughs> well, it's hard to explain. But placed after God, it would turn the sentence into is God. Okay. So? Kojima is God. Cecile's uh... name is the message. I don't believe it. Kojima is God. That's Kojima a very real God. thing to put in your game, uh, Kojima. Because... <laughs> Maybe Kojima kind of is full of himself. Maybe just a little bit. <laughs> I was talking... <laughs> we were talking about um, portable ops last night and how um, um, Campbell kind of becomes more in character as the game goes on about like being willed with women. Uh, Carlos is also kind of fucking weird. You can tell they were probably the oh, same character at one time. Ah, it is wonderful. Good to hear. I was worried someone as cultured as you would find the plant a little uncouth. Uncouth? Ah, you've got albatross and frigate birds and terns and tropic birds. Seabirds I have never had a chance to see in France. Oh, well... Great. I'm sorry. I know I should not spend all day chasing birds. Is there anything I can help with? I appreciate the offer, but I'm not sure what I could ask you to do. Well, I'm certainly not cut out to shoot a gun. Cecile, where'd you learn to move through the forest like that? The birds weren't scared of you at all. Becoming one with the forest is the very essence of bird watching. They want to behave naturally if they sense a human nearby. And that can really affect your observations. I see. Kind of like scouting, then. I am also good at spotting birds from a distance, tracking them based on the tiniest of clues. I wonder how Bowen Atkin Downs feels about half of his roles being anime sex men. You're starting to sound even more like a scout. The only way to find a bird is to think like a bird. Now, think you can I find mean, at this point, he's probably me? used to it. Yeah. As long as hopefully he himself is not a creep. <laughs> Jeez. Macaroons? Okay. <laughs> I said we were gonna listen to all of these, so we're listening to all of these. <laughs> We've been going for almost five hours at this point and still haven't played the game. Did you live in Paris your whole life before coming? He seems like a normal guy, but I don't know. Yes. Yeah, that's it yeah. <laughs> you never really know. Paris is the world capital of art and culture. It has the latest fashion, the best cuisine, and the most elegant, refined people. The beauty of the Champs-Élysées at night is almost unearthly. The name comes from Elysium, the name of paradise in Greek mythology. Heaven, in other words. Hmm. Must be nice for some people. Not for me. Are you saying the cultured life does not appeal to you? I'm saying I never had a chance to lead one. Not that it appealed to me anyway. You prefer war? I don't like war. Life outside heaven just suits me better. That's Jesus died for somebody's no. sins, but if not mine. Have a in France, I will show you around Paris. Then you will see what heaven on earth is really like. Heaven on earth, huh? The only image I have of France is the Foreign Legion. Ah, that, that is how you view France? What do the French think of them? Mm, it is a difficult question. We normally don't think about it so much. Well, critics claim it forces foreigners to take on the most dangerous missions, so French citizens won't get hurt. Mm, you are right. That probably had something to do with why it was created. But I understand that along with service comes benefits, such as French citizenship, 
and permanent residency. Those who join are all given an equal chance, regardless of race, religion, education, social status, or national origin. I kind of doubt that. So it can be a godsend for people from poor countries. Hmm. A way for the have-nots to live a decent life. I guess that's not so different from MSF. Isn't the whole thing about... I forget what they call it. It's like... French disillusionment syndrome or something? Where people go to Paris and then realize it kind of sucks and get all depressed about it. Anytime a piece of media tries to like blowify Paris, I just think of that. <laughs> like actually it's probably pretty bad. Or at least like mediocre. There's one other image I have of France. The national anthem. Ah, la Marseilles. Not everyone is a fan, of course. The whole to armed citizens. May an impure blood water our furrows. Probably like all other cities. Yeah, I've heard that Paris is like actually worse than you would expect. <laughs> like... what the side of the revolution represented, the ruling classes in neighboring countries supplied all kinds of pressure on the young government. La Marseillaise became the anthem of the volunteer armies that sought to protect constitutional rule against that pressure. And they couldn't do that without armed force. We. Oui. I agree, some parts are a little belligerent, but we must not forget that if it were not for them, France would not be the democracy it is today. Have you ever seen The Umbrellas of Cherbourg? A movie? No, never seen it. No? It came out ten years ago. <sighs> Catherine Deneuve. She's so beautiful in it. And the music, the costumes, the colors. Ah. Huh. It takes place in the naval port of Cherbourg. That was a beachhead in Normandy. It is set back when young men were conscripted to fight in the Algerian War. Hmm. The French government called the conflict a public order operation in northern Africa. I was still a little girl then. But I can clearly remember one of my friend's older brothers going off to fight. Yeah, national service is required in France. The war split up two young lovers. Director Jacques Demy's lyrics and Michel Legrand's music ah, tore at my heart. I will never forget its wonderful melodies. Are you okay? It changes lives. Changes fates. War is not a good thing. For some reason, it strikes a chord to hear that coming from someone like you. It's so sad seeing people talk about cool shit just for Snake to talk about its military purpose. I was thinking that, yeah. Like any topic you bring up, he'll make it about war in some way or another. Which, you know, makes sense considering who he is, but yeah. I'm trying to think. I feel like they never... Mm. In Metal Gear Solid V, I feel like they kind of play with the fact that Snake can't relate to people, but... That's a weird thing to bring up now for reasons, <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, Metal Gear Solid 3 in this game kind of tried to make Snake out to be charming, but he's kind of just, <laughs> just kind of just a weirdo when it comes to that kind of stuff. Speaking of the Algerian War of Independence... And they kind of did, did it in 3, too, when he was, like, ah, gushing about you guns. the novel that was made into a movie last year. The OAS, a militant French underground group, plots to assassinate de Gaulle, hiring a hitman known as the Jackal. Readers know that de Gaulle was not killed, but it is still so exciting. If someone was going to try to eliminate me, I would hope they would be as thorough as the Jackal. To know everything about me, without me suspecting a thing. 
Oh yeah. Okay. Hmm. I wonder if my birds feel the same way. I wonder. I think Cecile might be like a true crime lady, a true crime woman. France conducted its first successful nuclear test in the Algerian Sahara in 1960. A lot of French scientists took part in the Manhattan Project. They defected to America to escape wartime occupation. Correct. And once the war was over, they returned to France and continued their own atomic research. President de Gaulle did not want to have to rely on the American nuclear umbrella for protection. Thus making France the world's fourth nuclear power. Some say the test success pacified the Algerian rebels. The civil war was undoubtedly held in check. But never have I equated nuclear weapons with peace. That actually makes her kind of stand out among our group of, group of allies. Multiple people have been like, oh yeah, nukes thing about peace. France has produced many philosophers over the years. Descartes, Bataille, Sartre, Baudrillard. Yeah, I'm familiar with Sartre myself. He called Che Guevara the most complete man of the century, didn't he? Smart guy. He does tend to sympathize with the left. And what else do you know about him? That's it. You know nothing else? Nope. Ooh la la! The man is one of the giants of existentialism, you know? Existentialism? <laughs> Come on, Snake. Uh, I need to look into that. Nothing more dangerous than sneaking in without first securing an exit. <laughs> no! Existentialism! <sighs> Sometimes I wonder if my English is not better than yours. Sorry, I'm just not into philosophy. Ah, is that so? I would imagine it might really enrich your life. I'd rather take action now than spend time thinking about what we are or how we're supposed to live. Snake, that's what you do I all the time. Say, I live my philosophy. Ah, uh, fine. Well, okay. <laughs> that sounds like something Sartre would say. Yeah. He says we are born with no defined nature and that we are free to make ourselves what we wish. Free? So he was one of those devil may care kind of guys, huh? No. Actually, he meant that because we are free to create our own life, we must take full responsibility for our actions. Man is condemned to be free, is how he put it. Condemned to be free? But then, others will take it upon themselves to define who you are. I've been feeling that way lately. I keep telling people to call me Snake, but nobody seems to listen. Mm. Satra also said, Hell is other people. Snake. Constantly, yeah. or well, yeah, snake constantly getting dead named. Do you have an interest in the visual art, Snake? Not really. Please, no deep conversation. <laughs> but you have heard of Picasso, yes? Yeah, I've heard the name. Sadly, Monsieur Picasso, co founder of Cubism, passed away in the south of France last year. <clears throat> France was his own, you know. Huh? I thought he was born in Spain. Do you know his full name? Pablo Picasso. Anyone would know he's Spanish with a name like... Huh. Shows what do you know. What do you mean? Okay. Here we go. <gasps> Pablo Diego José Francisco de la Pala Juan Nepomucino Maria de los Remedios Cipriano de la Santísima Trinidad Ruiz y Picasso. <sighs> what do you think? That was his full name. Still... I don't see how... A master of modern art. A genius who crafted over 100,000 works in various styles, spending the greater part of his life in France. The man is a part of our culture. Yeah, that kind of stuff is of limited use in my field. But back to the point. Picasso was Spanish, right? Or am I missing something? Hmm. He wasn't French, right? Right? <sighs> Cecile... Uh uh, <laughs> what difference does it make? It does not matter if he was from Spain or from Mars. Picasso is Picasso. It does not change the fact that he lived in France, nor does it take away from his monumental legacy. Why do you care so much about where he was from, anyway? Whatever happened to the sans-frontier part of Militaire sans-frontier? Uh, you started it. 
Frogs was his name. <laughs> what was that? Nothing. Hey, Picasso also kind of sucks. <laughs> I think Picasso is severely overrated. And may or may not have been like funded by the CIA or something. I feel like I've heard people talk about shit like that. Tell me, Snake, do you ever put sweets in your rations? Never thought about it before. Why? Ah, I simply love them. French sweets are très délicieux. Everyone knows crepes, but there are also profiteroles, éclairs, madeleines, financiers. Then there's tartatin, and you can't forget Savarin. Oh, and milpule, crepes. You already no said more. crepes, I think. Yeah, you already mentioned crepes. Yeah. <laughs> Soufflés, croquembouche, cannelle, florentine, queen amagne, peach melbas. Finished. And macaroons. I love those the most. Macaroon Parisian are the best. They are so cute and colorful. And they contain meringue, so they melt right in your mouth. Wow. Because it was a communist no fuzzy? Macaroons were that popular in France, too. What do you mean in France, too? Macaroons are those. I don't know. <laughs> I just think it's all just not that good. Excuse you? And people will say a lot of stuff about a lot of people. Not coconuts. Don't they have peanuts in them? I've had them in Japan a few times. Oh, no, I, th I might I be thinking of, um... Macarons. <gasps> I'm thinking of, um... Pollock, I think. I am sure. French macarons have a long and distinguished history. They're dead back to the 16th century. Who is also <laughs> severely overrated. into the French royal family. The story goes that her patissier shared the recipe after they arrived. That is a history of over 500 years. So, they're originally from Italy, then. Uh, well... Uh, don't macaroons come from Italy, too? Uh, look, I do not really think... Keep in mind, macaron is almost identical to macaroni. Well, <laughs> that settles it. I cannot believe this. To associate macaroons with macaroni? You, Monsieur Miller, are an insensible... Oh... Why am I the bad guy? Come on, Cecile, wait! Cecile! Uh. I don't know what this is. Kaz is horribly down bad. I thrilled seeing him so, um... Maybe pathetic is a strong word, but <laughs> so boyish in this game compared to him later on. Number of warheads detected by the dew line, 57. Number of MIRVs included, minimum 29, maximum 35. Target region, United States, East Coast. Estimated time of re-entry, 2048 Zulu. President selected attack option? Unknown. The president is dead? Unknown. Communication has been lost. I select Offutt Air Force Base as my target. Offutt? But that's a U.S. base. What on earth do you mean? Based on the projected number of incoming warheads, Washington, D.C. is presumed destroyed. The president is most likely dead. The U.S. government's control lost. I realize that. So why not retaliate? With both sides destroyed, global anarchy would ensue. Recovery would be... difficult. The United States' nuclear strike capability must therefore be neutralized in order oh. to preserve the communist bloc, where government remains largely intact. Oh, wow. Okay. You're fighting with the enemy. You can't be serious. Tell me, how do you define enemy? <laughs> there are no borders in this world. The same conclusion again and again. Where is the flaw? All right, let's try something else. Commencing test. Understood. You're crossing a suspension bridge. Is this my mission? Yes, your destination is the other side. The bridge is wide enough for only one person to pass at a time. A man is approaching from the opposite side. He's carrying a gun. I shoot him. Suppose he's your husband. 
I shoot him in self-defense to spare him the grief. One must die and one must live. Next question. Mm -hmm. Your father asks you to fix the roof and mow the lawn. When you climb the ladder onto the roof, the ladder is taken away. I fix the roof. And when you're finished, I jump down. You'll break more than bones at this height. I see no need to change my decision. I have not finished mowing the lawn. I must remain loyal to the mission. Next. There is a snake in the bushes. It is poisonous. I need you to get rid of it. I chase it back to its nest. You can't. The snake's too vicious. It's already killed many people. I chase it away. It will bite you unless you kill it. Go home. Kill me. Kill me now. Why not kill the snake? Your mission is to get rid of it. Is this what you call loyalty? What are you loyal to? Country? Ideology? Feelings? I... I... I am loyal to myself. Who's there? <gasps> Who's that? Intruder! That was really good. That was awesome. <laughs> Jeez, okay. That actually kind of gave me goosebumps. That was really good. Ah. Well, that was the last tape. At the moment. I'm gonna save again. When I, uh, when I upload this to YouTube, I'm probably going to split this into multiple parts. So all of the tapes will be on, like, the same video. So I'm going to... Take a quick break. Just to, just to stand up and stretch my legs and stuff. But, when we get back... We'll actually play the game. <laughs> we should be able to do the Monster Hunter mission. And we can also grind to complete Zeke. But most importantly, I'm probably gonna do these do these missions again so y'all have context. <laughs> and then fight Peace Walker again and hopefully win. But for now, I'm going to stretch my legs. So, I'll be right back. Thanks. Thank you again, everybody, for sticking around for all of the all of the tapes, um, and thank you for the clips as well. I'm curious what those might be, considering considering we've just been listening to other people talk. But we'll check them out at some point. Anyway, be right back. <laughs> 